Hello everyone, welcome to What If Ichigo Was In High School DxD Part 4, Chapter 10. Dirty. The cool sensation seeping into her skin had her ancient eyes watching in amusement as the beginnings of the bond began to coalesce in an ethereal chain between herself and the little devil. Her master, the thought filling her with mirth. A feeling only further riled by the fact she had yet to even ask for his name. Not that she didn't know already. His descent into the abysmal bowels had left its mark to those old and wise enough to read the signs. She slipped her eyes away from the bubbling magic and sifted over his features. Strong and angular with just a hint of softness. Tiamat had eaten such men before both figuratively and literally. Soft laughter rumbled within her throat, the sound easily carrying to his demonically enhanced ears and causing him to glance up and look at her. The moment their eyes met, he stiffened, and as she could practically see the mental shield snap in place behind those brown eyes creeping with a hint of red. His very touch possessed the potential to forever mar the sky and earth on the barest whim, yet he could barely restrain his instincts to mate with her. What an adorable little abomination her new master was. Ancient that she was, her sight was not limited to the flesh of the world and that of life. Rather, it was a simple matter for her to perceive with heart and mind that which was alien and unknown to the common rabble that paraded themselves across one world to the next. And what a perception the child, for even by the lives of man was he entirely too young, before her provided. Beneath bone and sinew. Past the soul that yearned to pierce the sky. She could easily see the darkness swarm along throes of fire and enmity. For many, what she saw would be an undeniable evil. For one with an understanding as deep as hers, she comprehended it as a thing far, far worse. It was judgment. Sentence taken to such an extreme that it became the initial reason that mortality came to be a thing dreaded and the reapers touched to be abhorred with vehemence. And this young creature, barely out of the domains of man's childhood, was bound for vermore to the primordial aspect of retribution. Pushing past her musings, she smiled demurely as the final words fell from his lips and the chant ended. A soft glow ruptured between them, and suddenly Tiamat was assaulted with passive impressions and thoughts that did not belong to her. So the bond is done, she whispered quietly as she overturned her arm, examining the magic bindings that linked her to the young devil from across her. Yeah, a hint of uncertainty ringing in her ears from him. Her lips quirked at the thought of him regretting his decision to bind himself to her. A hasty decision on his part, but that was the privilege of the young. Allowance of mistakes was that which willed growth. With a graceful fluidity, she drew herself to her full height and set her shoulders back. All too aware of his stolen glances towards her bosom, Tiamat set her countenance of stone and spoke with a regal tone that ruptured whatever lust laden thoughts had imbued upon his mind. I am Tiamat, her voice dropping to a gravel-like vibrato. She who arose from the primordial oceans and gave life to the power that would be Mesopotamia and the lesser tongues. There was a slight widening of his eyes and he moved to speak, but she did not allow him to deny her moment. Upon distant shores of the river time did I erect glorious constructs of the transient and the undying. She pressed the fingers of one hand to the hollow of her throat and willed the full majesty of her stare into his being. I am mother and destroyer. I am the life at the beginning and the chaos at the end. To you, one of fire and shadow, do I offer myself. In prosperity and ambition, let the world tremble beneath our wake. Again, he made to say something, yet she cut him off swiftly. In one powerful step, Tiamat closed the distance between them and leaned in to mesh their lips firmly together. He gave a muffled cry of surprise and made to push back, but she locked her hands firmly across the sides of his jaw. The heat radiating from him trickled onto her soaking skin and filled her lungs with the scent of flavored smoke. She kept them together for a moment before slowly leaning back and giving a teasing flick of her tongue over his lips. Tiamat gave a low laugh as she felt the blood rushing through his face. He gave a rather fair impression of a fish deprived of its water. Really now, how delectably endearing this child is. Little one. Patient tone warring with her mischievous eyes. You are meant to introduce yourself. He swallowed quite audibly and stammered out. Aichigo Kurosaki. Her lips curved dangerously as her eyes fell half-lidded. Well met, my new master. He continued to stare at her, much to her great amusement. Um, Tiamat hummed as she dropped one hand onto his shoulder and allowed it wrap around him as she walked behind him. What are you doing? He finally seemed to regain his bearing as his query came out a wary half-sigh, and she dropped her chin onto the soft skin between shoulder and neck. Momentarily ignoring him, she pressed herself onto him, willing the warmth searing off his body into hers. If anything, she had gained a fantastic heat generator in the form of her new master. While wormkind do not fully appreciate the meaning of modesty, I doubt our guest will welcome my bare nature. She nuzzled his neck with her chin, allowing her white hair to spill over his shoulder. Best. He softly murmured even as she felt him reach out with his senses. She was surprised when she felt a moment of horror through their shared bond as the sensation of frost and snow gave way to familiarity. The figure approaching them was quite a distance away, albeit rapidly closing the distance, and was not so powerful as to warrant concern. Whoever it was was certainly stronger than her newfound master was, yet that was only as he was now. 
she had no illusions as to whether or not he could defeat the approaching being in his true form. And even if that were not the case, Tiamat herself was here and together, there were but a handful in the world who could weather their combined might. You wouldn't happen to have a way to clothe yourself with you? He whispered while staring off miserably. Tiamat in fact did have ways of covering herself in mortal garb, uncomfortable that she found it to be. Unfortunately for her master, his current distress was far too amusing for her to do anything to end it. I do. Her arms tightened around him. But you're not going to. He breathed dejectedly as her chin fell along with his shoulders. She allowed a gentle rumble from her chest to demonstrate her enjoyment of the situation. Already you begin to understand me so well, little one. I do believe we will work out quite adequately. He let out a soft sigh. Nisan is going to kill me. Diamat straightened herself, letting her arm slip from his shoulders. Surprisingly, her master dragged his shirt over his head and deftly took it off in one flexible movement. He shook droplets of water out of his hair, and Tiamat was left appreciating a rather acceptable specimen of a humanoid male. She tilted her head to the side, watching droplets of water run down his torso and slowly trace over the V-forming just above his groin. The heaviness of the water had pulled down his trousers and left just enough for the imagination to have its fair share of entertainment. Hour in spades, physically appealing all that was left was to ascertain his mental fortitude. A most satisfactory master indeed. The wave of demonic power rolled off him, instantly drying the body she was appreciating, as well as the clothing apparel he surprisingly offered her. If only for the sake of my sanity. He gave a dry huff as he averted his gaze. Though why was beyond her. He had already stared enough to burn a permanent image into his mind. Following his example, Tiamat touched her inner fire and promptly dried herself as well and accepted his shirt. She looked at the strange piece of attire before mimicking the way he had worn it and slipped her neck around the center hall while her arms through the side once. What a novel experience. The last occasion of her spending time amongst mortals involved them wrapping the cloth around themselves or having it pinned together. It was quite large on her, despite her being taller than him, and the garb left a great deal of room for her to maneuver inside of. She felt as if she were inside a makeshift bag. While it fell to just above her thighs, leaving her entire legs bare, she thought it quite comfortable. What manner of garment is this? Her eyes returned to look at him, and a bewildered expression crossed her face as she found desire and need coloring his gaze once more. How odd. Why does the addition of apparel arouse him? Surely the lack of should be cause for lust. He closed his eyes and drew in a heavy breath as he pinched his nose. Why do I even bother? She heard him mutter. He swept his hair back and turned towards her. She noted he put in extra effort to only look into her eyes. It's called a jersey. The Amat fingered the soft and silk-like material. Ever-changing mortals. Her mouth twisted in humor. You will have to bring me to the bazaar at some point little master. I am eager to see what other designs pass as garments in this age. He raised a curious brow at her. You've been out of touch for that long from the world. And stop calling me that. I have a name you know and I prefer it being used. She walked over to the young devil and placed her hands on his shoulders once more. About to respond, Tiamat's eyes suddenly swept to the side as silver lined the edges of her vision. The arriving had finally arrived. Tiamat cast a careful eye as the female devil carefully swept tresses over her brow before freezing halfway through the motion. Her eyes widened ever so slightly as they shifted back and forth from Tiamat to Ichigo. Curiously, she noted how the female devil was concentrating on her master's garment that she was wearing in a furious piercing stare. Jealousy? Perhaps the silver-haired she-devil was her master's lover. However, Tiamat quickly dismissed the notion as silver eyes rapidly shifted to her master and began checking him over for injuries. Not jealousy then, concern with a hint of indignation. The chigo kun, the devil accentuated slowly as the rock beneath her feet crept with a thin layer of ice. Why are you half-naked with a dragon king? Her eyes flicked over to her master as he took a nervous step back. How interesting. Humor danced lightly across star sapphire eyes. He is the mightier of the two, but still he fears her perhaps she holds an authoritative position amongst the devils. I swear it's not what it looks like. He raised his hands in appeasement. Tiamat gave a soft laugh as she repositioned herself behind him. The she-devil tensed as Tiamat gingerly placed her fingers on his chin and tilted his head back onto her shoulder, despite his protest and struggle. She was physically stronger than he was so long as he refused to reveal his true form. Turning her sight downwards and meeting brown eyes, she firmly proclaimed, we are bonded. You bonded with a dragon king. Yes he did. Her tone falling flat while her eyes slit. Is that an issue? Disregarding any subtlety, she flared her impressive might and allowed her will to crash onto the underworld. Surprise crossed the other female's face before it quickly hardened into a stern glower, and she began to push back, albeit just barely. No. It is not. She said tersely. The Amat gave a victorious smirk. Good. Sapphire and Silver warred against one another momentarily. The message having been said wordlessly so as to not alert the soul male. It is most certainly an issue. 
The tension was cut abruptly when her master broke in. What are you doing here Grafiani? The two continued to stare at each other for a moment before the newly identified Grafia broke off the stare and said to her master. Mathers may have indirectly informed me of your predicament when half the underworld felt two near Satan level powers clash together rather violently. She gave a dry stare towards the two of them. Though it seems I worried needlessly. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Grafia crossed her arms. Do not be. I have understood that in no part of this were you in the wrong. The Amad arched an eye as the silver-haired devil turned towards her. Grafia Lucifuge. Dragon King Tiamat, I presume? You presume correctly. Will you be returning with us my lady? If so, my master Lucifer would like to speak with you. There are a number of things which must be addressed if a person of your stature is going to be a Chigokun's familiar. The Amad allowed her words to sift through her head before giving a solid nod. You need not refer to me as such, merely my name will do. I forfeited all titles of lordship millennia ago save for Dragon King, but yes. I will accompany you and my new master to speak with your lord. It has been nearly 50 years since Urzich's and I last spoke. I am curious to see how that child has grown. Her master gave her a surprised glance before schooling his features. She resisted the smile threatening to form on her lips. He would quickly learn that everyone was a child when compared to her. Very well then. Grafia spread the fingers of one hand and a rotating white circle of magic appeared before her. If you will step in then. All three of them treaded into the circle and Tiamat felt a twisting sensation along her spine as the world collapsed around them and distorted. Once the feeling dissipated, Tiamat found herself standing in a magnificent courtyard with sculptures of substantial size and a bubbling spring fountain. Welcome to Bastion Lucifer, Ichigo muttered from beside her. She cast an observing eye over the colossal building and its winding archway architecture. Various gargoyles sculpted to make the impression of them scaling the walls fit in among gigantic glass windows. Most impressive. Several of the palaces in the days during my reign could not compare to this structure. Admittedly, we had the habit of building skywards rather than expanding across the ground. He snorted from besides her. If you want tall, I'll take you to New Lilith. You can't even see the sky without craning your neck all the way there. Very well then, she slipped an arm through his. I will hold you to your offer. He eyed her for a second before giving a barely perceivable shake of his head. Grafia turned towards the pair. I assume you would like to freshen up and, perhaps, clothe yourselves before meeting Serzich's Sama. The Amat found it unnecessary but looked towards her master even as he did the same. If it's all the same to you, he said tonelessly. I'd like to get this over with. She nodded her head and both turned Grafia. Very well, let us be off then. She didn't sound too pleased. If Tiamat had to guess, the she-devil was quite used to a certain level of decorum and did not appreciate their current state of attire. It was a shame for her that dragons valued practicality right under sleep and their pride. Never wake a slumbering dragon. She had burned more than one kingdom down for a nap ruined. As they passed through massive halls and winding staircases, Tiamat kept her fingers lightly wrapped around her master's forearm. He barely seemed to register her presence as a wall seemed to have erected over their fledgling link from his side. Not that she couldn't do the same. However, there was something peculiarly different about him all of a sudden. No more was he consistently stealing glances at her. No more was her ancient allure pulling at the base desires of his kind that ran so strong. She marveled at the abrupt change. Gone was the child and standing instead was an adamantine resolution mired with ire. What change was occurring in that head of his? Eventually the three of them found themselves before a pair of massive doors coated with numerous engravings, save for one small flat square of wood. Grafia did not bother to knock and simply pushed the giant slabs forward. The moment she did however, they were rewarded with the sound of music and a rather odd sight. Snapping his fingers while his hips gyrated in a bizarre, if not rhythmic manner, the child she remembered as a hardened war veteran and slayer of thousands, sang with an unnaturally high-pitched voice. Show them how funky, strong is you. With a kick to the air, the young leader of the devil spun around and froze in his spot at the sight of his newfound audience. The thick silence descended onto the chamber, and Tiamat subtly appraised the reactions of the other two with her. Judging by the lack of surprise, this was not something that was considered odd to them. Granted she knew very little about devil culture. Uh, this is exactly what it looks like. Grafia pinched the bridge of his nose while shutting her eyes tight. Her master on the other hand looked as impassive as he had on the journey towards here. Serzich has cleared his throat. Right well it seems you've returned safe and sound Ichigo-kun. And you've even brought back Dragon King Tiamat with you. So how was your trip to Ichigo-kun? Serzich's face fell uncertain as he trailed off. Halfway through the devil speaking, her master had gently pried her fingers off his arm and began to stalk towards the redeed. Uncertainty gaining strength on his countenance, Serzich's tried called out once more. Ichigo-kun. As he stopped before Serzich's, Tiamat noted the clenched fist by her master's side. It was swifter than any mortal eye could follow as, wide and tight, knuckles crashed into Serzich's face. 
even from across the considerable distance of the chamber, the crushing of cartilage and the fracturing of bone made themselves audible to her ears. For a single, measly second, Serzicha stayed still as her master's fist dug deep into his face. Nevertheless, he was quickly picked up off his feet and launched forward with considerable force. His body twisting through the air, Serzicha's went sailing over his desk and smashed clean through the window in the back. Her master straightened himself quickly and shook his hand, sending small flecks of blood to the floor while ignoring the fading sound of a girlish scream. Ass hat, he muttered. Turning back around, he spoke with a light frown. Sorry about that Nissan, but it was long overdue. I'll pay for the window, by the way. Tiamat heard a long-suffering sigh from beside her. It's quite alright. He nodded. Well in that case, I'll be off taking a nap. He grimaced as he stretched his back. For future reference, I don't recommend sleeping in a cave. Uli noted, Grafia said dryly. As he approached her, Tiamat had a teasing smile in place. Really now he's absolutely adorable. Ichigo let out a grunt of contentment as he collapsed onto his bed in a soundless crash and shut his eyes. He really needed a good sleep because, as things stood, even though he wasn't injured, his battle with Tiamat had taken its toll on his body. Speaking of said dragon. His eyes slowly drifted open as he fingered the soft cotton sheets. Standing at the foot of his bed, still wearing nothing but a conjured jersey, which was due to fade any minute now, Tiamat smiled with half-lidded eyes. Right, he sighed as he dragged a tired hand over his face. I should get a maid to set you up with a room. Her smile sharpened. No need. She bent over and crawled slowly onto the bed on all fours. All too big for her, the collar of the jersey fell down and graced him with the sight of her free cleavage. Three seconds later, he felt the warm sensation of her naked thighs, pressing on his still bare abdominals dammit. He just remembered that his cargo pants were also conjured, and the magic supporting them was due to expire as well. She leaned back, her firm buttocks pushing against his quickly hardening lower self. Hmm. There it was again. That dark purr that immediately got a reaction out of him. Her jeweled eyes fell into a gloom and looked down at him with a shadowed gaze. The Chigo held in his breath as his fingers dug into the mattress. He tightened his abdominal muscles, willing his body to ignore the responses she was lacing out of it. I really want to sleep. He gritted out. Those eyes. Those damned eyes that turned his head in and out. How could something be so appealing yet terrifyingly hungry at the same time? She leaned in, pressing her breasts onto his chest, and the only thing that separated their bare skin was a thin layer of magical polyester. Spangled and impish eyes devoured his thoughts as a mane of wild white hair fell on either side of his face. Ensuring that all he could see was her. Oceanic breeze, cool and light, washed over his face as her lips parted. Do you not wish to mate with me? Hell yes. I want to sleep. He reiterated with strained difficulty. Her hands brushed back the orange strands that lightly fell across his eyes. Why not? I'd rather save my first for someone special. The majestic and fine brow rose at that. You are no innocent maid. Scowling, he said, how would you know that? Her expression remained unbelieving, but a hint of teasing came back. One with his virginity intact would not have so possessively placed his hands on me. The Chigo blinked in confusion. What was she talking? His eyes widened in disbelief as he realized that his hands had subconsciously moved to wrap themselves across her lower back. The cool touch of her amber skin sending jolts of electricity up into his arms. Her lips curved back into that infuriating smile. Almost habitual I would say. The Chigo clenched his teeth. Is there another? A lover that causes you to stay your hands. He exhaled sharply across her face. There's no one. She fell silent for a moment before understanding lit her eyes. Ah I see. Her vexing mien fell away into carefully constructed neutrality. Heartbreak then or rather severe disenchantment. The wave of cold ran through him, running fierce against the river of fire that her body enthused out of his. You need to stop, his voice had fallen to a flat menace. She traced his jaw with her fingers as she sat up on his waist and regarded him coolly. So be it. He looked away from her, regretting having momentarily lost his temper, but closed his eyes rather than apologizing. There were certain things he really did not want to talk about. Several moments passed where Ichigo did his best to force himself into a slumber, but it was to no avail. The constant beating of his heart thrummed in his ears and even worse, was the enticing beat of hers. Supernaturally enhanced senses working heavily against him in his current situation, Ichigo placed his forearm across his eyes and huffed. I've made my decision. He nearly groaned aloud as she broke the appreciated silence. What decision? He intoned from behind his arm. The decision to invoke your own debt. His arm fell away as he gave her a cautionary, if somewhat hostile, look. Me owing you does not mean you get to go digging through my personal life. She shook her head, leaving heavy weaves of white strands to fray lightly across her shoulders. I simply wish for you to do something. Ichigo felt his eyes narrow in anger. You are not forcing me to have sex with you. She allowed a deep chuckle to reign over his ears. No, no. A single finger fell on his lips and traced them softly. 
A dark purr ripped through her throat and the blue in her gaze waved in a silent furor. He was faintly aware of his fingers tracing rings across her lower back with the lines of his nails. Nothing so crass. Tonight. He raised a brow. Tonight. She froze for a moment before her lips twisted wickedly. Every night. A sense of foreboding and, dare he say it, anticipation rushed through him. He wouldn't lie to himself. He wanted this woman. He wanted to do things to this woman. Every night what? She tilted her head and allowed her hair to pull to one side as she held him with a predacious gleam. She let out a soft growl, sending a sea salt wind over his face and revealing ivory white canines. Every night, conquering light shone out of her eyes. You're going to kiss me. He stared blankly when her fingers tracing the edges of his mouth stopped and set to a soft tapping across his jaw. I'm going to what? She smirked in satisfaction and a guttural sound escaping her throat sent shivers into his skull. A simple meeting of the lips. A chaste moment for the rest of the nights we are bound. This, I decree to be your repayment for obligation owed. For the rest of the nights we are bound. An unnerved light passed his eyes. She nodded slowly, biting her lower lip as her half-lidded stare remained transfixed on him. He took a moment to actually think about it. It could not be that simple. It was never that simple. What's the catch? She blinked in confusion. Catch. We are not hunting anything. He parted his lips to respond but merely dropped his head onto his pillow. Underlying context which generally portrays an ulterior motive. What a way for the charged atmosphere to be dispelled. He rolled his eyes at the sheer ridiculousness. I see, she said after a pause and looking away in thought. Her hands moved away from his face and spread flat against his chest. She leaned over, pressing herself onto him again, and stared with serpentine blues. I believe it is obvious what I am attempting. Regardless of my reasons, will you accept or will I be required to select a path more radical? He looked at her. This absurdly beautiful creature that had lived for an extraordinary number of years he didn't even want to imagine. Why on earth was she so dead set on doing this? With him of all people. He sighed in defeat as he let his body go slack and stared up at the ceiling. He brought up both hands, pushed back his hair, and blew out a long breath of frustrated air. His eyes shifted down. Why do I get the feeling that I'm going to regret this? That infuriating smile came back as she kissed him for the second time that day. The chigo let out a soft groan as a hefty knock on his door woke him. Yeah, yeah. Come in. He blinked away the daze and only realized too late that there was weight comfortably settled across his chest. He ignored his bedroom door swinging open and opted instead to examine the spray of white silk flitted along his torso. He trailed down the wild mane with his eyes and felt his hand holding the velvet curve of her hip. Their lower halves were concealed by white furs, but nevertheless, the sensation of her skin rubbing against his, as her entire leg laid over him, sent sparks through his nerves. The clothing he had summoned having long since dissipated. Naisama, I as the boy abruptly ceased speaking, Ichigo threw a hand over his eyes. Oh fuck me sideways. Ichigo quickly yanked the furs and drew them two up to Tiamat's chin. The Dragon King shifted in her sleep as she released a warm breath over his bare chest. Who's that Naisama? Ichigo looked over to Milika's. The young boy had his head tilted in question as he politely stood with his hands behind his back. Quite unsure with himself, Ichigo elected to go with the truth. Dragon King Tiamat, he grunted out. Milika's eyes lit with excitement as he nearly hopped in place. Really she's a real Dragon King like Tannen. That's so cool. Tiamat stirred and her nails dug into Ichigo's chest painfully as she let out a growl of discontent. He instinctively began to rub the small spot opposite of her navel, and her growls steadied into a set of quiet harshness. Pressing a finger to his lips, Ichigo shifted momentarily, and Milika's nodded his head vigorously in understanding. He cast a glance in her direction, an unconscious hand reaching up to stroke the crown of her head. Why is there a dragon in your bed and why are both of you naked? Ichigo cast an amused glance in Milika's direction as the nine-year-old leaned forward and whispered conspiratorially, pretending to glance over at the clock at the wall, the time having settled well into the afternoon, Ichigo pondered how to navigate this delicate situation, which would see Grafia murder him in all likelihood. Why don't you wait outside for and we'll finish this conversation elsewhere? He whispered. Let's not wake her. As Milika smiled in agreement, a third voice added itself to their talk. Too little too late for that. He frowned as he turned down to see her eyes glazed and sleep yet darkened with irritation. Sorry, didn't mean to wake you. Nuzzling her face into his shoulder and shutting her eyes, she expressed a pleased drum from her throat as she wrapped her arms around him tighter. Such a wonderful heater you are. Her voice still laden with drowsy fuzz. I aim to please, he drawled with a roll of his eyes and attempted to move out of her grip, but she remained vice-like around him. So much for clothing himself and taking Milika's as far away as possible from her. Naya. Her mouth stretched in a yawn, almost unnaturally wide, and her eyes drifted open once more. The hatchling belongs to Serzich's and the silver-haired one. Off to the side, Milika's mouthed hatchling in puzzlement. Yeah. 
A minor frown formed on his lips. How did you know? Her nose twitched. His scent is a brew of theirs. The moment passed and Tiamat lifted her head off his chest and fixed Milika's with a stare. As the young boy stiffened, Ichigo immediately snaked an arm around the neck of the ancient dragon and pulled her back to him. Tiamat's stare had been overwhelming to him. For a child such as Milika's, it would strip him of all free will and leave him an enslaved thrall to her primordial spirit. Don't do that. His fingers on the back of her neck tightened ever so slightly. As you will, little one. Her eyes closed once more as she rubbed her head against him, very much in a manner a cat would. You need not concern yourself. I do not prey on younglings. He looked down at her in minor alarm as she seemed to relax back into sleep. Did you just? The familiar bond has many uses, little one. Her eyes opened once more, swaying with teasing mirth. I meant no harm to you, young one. Tiamat's voice called. And to answer your question, I am his familiar. Milika's, who had remained silent up until now, took in surprise at being abruptly addressed. Oh wait a minute. You made a dragon king your familiar. Naisama that's amazing. That's even cooler than the Satan Rangers. Ichigo gave the young boy an indulgent smile, even as he caged his arms tightly around Tiamat. Least she do something to scar the poor kid. So what can I do for you Milika's? Can we train again? He asked in an excited rush. Ichigo let out a chuckle. Sure, meet me out in the courtyard in 15 minutes. Yes. Milika's gave a childish cheer before spinning around. Ichigo watched with an amused smile as Milika's ran out in a rush, leaving the door wide open. With a shake of his head, he flicked a finger, sending a sliver of magic to close the door and regain his privacy. He then turned towards the woman in his bed with a dry glare. You gonna let me up or what? I am tempted to keep you. He gripped her arms and, futilely, attempted to pry her off. At best, he managed to enter a sitting position, his back to the headboard. I'm starting to wonder who the master and who the familiar is here. She gave that laugh of hers. Well I shall endeavor to limit my mischief, let this be a lesson to you, my master. You'd be wise not to always trust a worm. Direct in our pride we may be, our cunning knows no bounds. Not even a day gone by and I'm learning that all too well, Ichigo let loose a tired sigh. He the cast a glance at the clock again and swore as he recalled something. Damn it, today's Saturday isn't it? What does it matter? She intoned from her place in his lap. I promised you Sokka I'd come and visit her today. Even as he finished muttering to himself, Ichigo distinctively felt a petrifying vim charge the air. He watched somewhat warily as Tiamat's head slowly rose at a low angle. It was quite disconcerting really, seeing her shadowed face trough a messy veil of hair. A single clawed hand fell on his shoulder and roughly pushed him back. Her other hand fell onto his chest, nails first, and like a jungle cat, Tiamat drew herself to hover over him. A fine white brow arched over a feral stare. Her. Right. Dragons. Immensely powerful possess a vicious temperament. Have a sex drive to put Succubi to shame. And absolutely hate having to share. The Chigo said his stare flat as he gripped the one hand that was digging into his shoulder. Calmly he took a hold and lifted her nails out of his flesh, his regenerative powers healing the incisions. Yes. Her. Despite the slow and pacified manner he was pushing her arm back, Ichigo was utilizing a tremendous amount of physical strength to accomplish the feat. Yusaka is a good friend, albeit a recent one. Ichigo held back a wince as he heard the bones in his hands crack. Instead, he simply continued to hold her passive glare. Where are you going? He raised a single eyebrow at her demanding tone. Although, she didn't give any inclination of apology or guilt. The pan, he said coolly. Their eyes remained locked. A cold seething through her gaze as his own remained neutral and distant. I will accompany you. She finally said. Oh. He amat laid her head down onto his lap again. It has been a long time since I visited my son who lives in the coasts of the isle to the east. Your son? She did not take offense at his disbelieving tone. It was my son who held the title of monarch amongst Wormkin before he retired and passed it on to you long. He is quite well known to the mortals of Japan. Rikjin, they call him. Ichigo's eyebrows rose to nearly meet his hairline. The Rikjin. The legendary dragon of the seas. The ruler of the oceans. That Rikjin. He could still feel the waves of jealousy through their familiar bond rolling off of her. My epithet is not merely for regalia. All dragons and serpents of the sea are of my blood. Ha. Huh. Absently, he placed a hand on top of her head and ignored the bout of irritation that flared from her. Should you not meet the child now? He blinked. Right, thanks for reminding me. Diamat rolled off a chigo and drew the covers around herself once more as she deposited herself onto his pillow once he stood. That was another thing about dragons, he remembered. The damn things were incredibly lazy. Naisama. Milikas greeted him cheerfully. Hey, listen up. Ichigo said as he crossed his arms and shifted his weight onto one foot. I'm running on a short schedule, so we're going to have to make this a quick run. So let's get started right away. Milikas gave an eager nod, but suddenly hesitated momentarily. 
Naisama, Akasama took Otusama to the hospital because he broke his face. Do you know how that happened? Nope, not a clue. The lie coming out smoothly. Now show me how far you've gone. Lilika's immediate jumped back and gathered an impressive amount of demonic energy. The young boy pressed the energy between his hands and sent it hurtling with a cry. Ichigo merely unfolded his arms and held out an open palm. The cascade of crimson and black collapsed onto his hand, pulsing wildly and hissing against his skin. Ichigo dug his fingers into the warped orb and, with sheer brute force, he tore the attack apart. A small cloud of energy sent small ribbons of demonic vitality crashing against the grounds. He turned his palm towards his face, examining the steam slithering off his slightly burned skin. The minor wound only increasing Ichigo's desire to learn to activate his hiero. Not bad, Ichigo said with a one-sided grin. But did you notice how the shape kept shifting? Lilikas bent his neck in acknowledgement. I can't get it to stay in a perfect sphere. Try and condense the attack. Condense. How do I do that? Ichigo held up a single finger. One thing I like to do is, instead of simply drawing the energy in one spot, I bring it in like a spiral. I, how do you say I twist it into place? He demonstrated by allowing demonic power to swirl on the tip of his finger and launched a massive zero into the sky. Milikas nodded with a determined glint in his eyes and proceeded to try again. Ichigo wore a pleased smile as Milikas managed to create a much smaller and tighter orb of his family's signature power of destruction. As the attack shot towards him, Ichigo once more held out his hand, however, this time he drew on a slight shard of his power. A thin layer of energy covered his hand as he caught the attack once more and let it discharge off to the side. The kid was veritable genius in terms of combat. Given a few years and he'd be making massive waves through the underworld. Much better. Ichigo said with a proud smile. Now, let's reduce the time it takes to charge up the attack and get you to aim while facing a moving target or moving yourself. Hell, we might as well cover them simultaneously. Milikas widened his stance and flared his small power, sending a wind of dark intentions across the courtyard. Ichigo smirked in response. Is it just me, or is the sun really glaring down? Ichigo shadowed his eyes with his hand as he and Tiamat floated in the sky a distance away from the city of Kyoto. The Dragon King, in her natural form, wound her long body around his much smaller frame. He turned to look at her as he felt a mental touch. The sun does not appreciate a brewing storm. He gave her a curious look. Amaterasu is doing this. Quold seem I am unwelcome. No matter, I have no quarrel with her. I will content myself with a visitation to my child. Keep yourself wary my master. With a monstrous gale that whipped his hair about and a thunderous roar in defiance of the setting sun, Tiamat stretched her wings and hurtled into the darkening sky. Ichigo shook his head as the harshness of the horizon lessened considerably and, indeed, became affectionate if anything. He could practically taste the message in the wind. Welcome home. He gave a light chuckle as he deposited his hands into his jeans and sanitoed away. Seconds later, he was walking through the streets of supernatural Kyoto that was filling up with the nocturnal Imkai. More than once he was accosted by thugs attempting to coerce him into shady dealings. A general small burst of malevolent power sent them scrambling away. As he approached the massive palace gates, Ichigo felt a prickling at his neck and turned around. He cast a sweeping gaze and found nothing. Only the average Imkai going about their business and the pale light of a rising and waxing moon, harsh and remote. It wasn't too long afterwards he found himself being led through the familiar winding halls of Yasaka's palace. A brief extension of his senses informed him that mother and daughter were located in the same place. As one of the palace maids bowed to him and drew aside the door, Ichigo walked past the threshold and froze right there. Wow. What's the occasion? Ani-san. How do I look? Kunu twirled around while giggling. You're late, Ichigo-san. Both nine tails had changed out of their traditional priestess garb. Kunu was sporting a light pink kimono traced with white petals of a plum blossoms as she danced in front of him. However, Ichigo only had eyes for Yasaka. The regal blonde has draped herself in a carmine kimono. Her waist-length golden hair was tied up and held together by elegant pins of jade. The light blush dusted across her pale skin drawing in his admiration and fully bringing out the brightness of her eyes. Wow. He said again, this time slightly breathless. Isaka's blush became deeper as she averted her face but kept her eyes on Ichigo. A stolen moment shared by the two went on for a few seconds before Kunu grabbed Ichigo's hand and tugged. Come on Ani-san. Let's go, let's go. He opened his mouth before promptly shutting it and gathered his thoughts in one coherent sentence. What's going on? Isaka held his eyes. The humans are holding a festival in Kunu and I were wondering if we could trouble you to accompany us. Well that was surprising. He was expecting a hopefully quiet evening of watching Kunu's antics while conversing with Yasaka over a cup of tea. I don't mind, he said with Wyla absently scratching the back of his neck. He then glanced down at his apparel and frowned. Jeans and a t-shirt were hardly appropriate for a festival. 
The Chigo snapped his fingers, weaving a web of magic over his clothes and transforming them into something a little more festive. He was quickly adorned with a light yukata of black dye and lined with navy blue. Deeming it a suitable fit, Ichigo nodded in content and looked back towards the two Kikbi. We're going now? Bolkunu looked wildly about in childish wonder, Yusaka committed herself to carefully observing her husband. Throughout the evening, he had appeared distracted and immersed in his own thoughts. More than once, she was forced to reiterate a question or express thought as he had not heard her. She looked at the ground sourly, having expected a night of quiet merriment, while Kunu thoroughly enjoyed herself. Instead, he was on a completely different world despite walking right beside her. From the corners of her eyes, she saw him constantly glance up at the sky, as if expecting something to rain down at any moment. Akasama. Kunu's voice snapping her out of her thoughts as well as grabbing Ichigo's attention. Isaka turned towards her daughter as she shook in excitement while pointing to a stall on the side. That one. That one. She examined the small front. A simple ring-tossing game for children offering stuffed animals as prizes. She smiled fondly as Kunu led her by the hand towards the game. Yusaka offered the elderly woman behind the counter some mortal currency and patted her daughter gently on the head. Their fox ears having been concealed by a magical glamour. Try your best. As the elderly woman turned away from another patron, she said, Really dear, I wouldn't be so keen on leaving a husband as good-looking as yours by himself. Yusaka blinked in surprise, and a strong blush quickly adorned her cheeks. He can take care of himself, she responded demurely. The old woman chuckled. A good wife takes care of her husband because he tends to be lost without her. However, you don't have to take it from me and my 47 years of marriage. Just take a garner at him. Isaka turned around, humoring the old woman, however, the smile on her face rapidly slid off. Standing there, his arms folded in the sleeves of his yukata and expression stony, Ichigo was being accosted by several young women. Most of them appearing to be but a few years younger than him. A flare of irritation crossed her face as a single girl placed an inviting hand on his arm. Having been watching Kunu the entirety of the group of girls' obvious flirtations, Ichigo slowly turned to appraise them. Isaka smirked in smug delight as the young humans flinched under the weighty gaze of her husband. Without so much as a, by your leave, Ichigo left them and walked back over to her and Kunu. As she moved to stand next to him, close enough to show a sense of intimacy, Yusaka sent a feral glance over her shoulder. The human girls practically ran away in fright. All with Kunu's wine regaining her attention. This is too hard. Let me try, Ichigo said quietly, sliding his hands out of his sleeves. As she accepted a few coins from him, the elderly human sent Yusaka a knowing grin and caused the golden nine tails to blush once more. With a lazy grace, Ichigo managed to secure all five rings around the metal rod and scored a prize, much to her daughter's delight. Which one do you want? He looked down at Kunu and asked her. Kunu placed a finger to her lips, thinking for a brief moment before pointing out her desired prize. That one. Isaka smiled softly as he plucked a fluffy blue serpent off the wall and handed it to Kunu. Momentarily snuggling her prize, Kunu showed off her new toy. Akasama, look. He's so cute. Isaka offered a gentle smile as the hissing face of the snake was shoved towards her. It's very nice, Kunu. They spent another hour walking around and visiting the many shops and attractions. Kunu played several more games while buying a few toys here and there. Eventually, the three of them settled down at a small sweet store. Isaka nibbled on bits of dango while Ichigo sat with a cup of seeming green tea. Their shoulders touching, Yusaka took a chance and leaned, pressing her soft curve onto his muscled arm. Ani San Kunu interrupted the hidden moment and waved a white porcelain mask at him. Do you want one? I have two. Whatever uncertainty had been clouding his eyes melted away and a faint smile, brimming with roguishness, formed on his lips. Yusaka quickly looked away as she felt a throb in her chest. No thank you. I have a lifetime supply of masks. Amusement layering every inch of his voice, he laid a gentle hand on Kunu's head. Oh, okay. She regarded the cryptic statement for a moment as she gave him a searching look. It was then, being so close to him, that Yusaka noted something of great interest. Ichigo-san, he regarded her curiously at her questioning tone. Forgive my curiosity but, why do you smell of dragons? Entirely ignoring Kunu, who leaned in to sniff him, Yusaka felt a constricting feeling as uncertainty flashed in his eyes, and he stiffened just barely. She tried to imagine that his avoidance of her eyes was a mere triviality. My new familiar is a dragon. I see. She said nothing further. A dragon. Kunu's odd voice drifted through the imagined tension. Yeah, Ichigo gave a slight laugh. She's a handful. Too late, Ichigo's breath sharpened as he realized his mistake and Yusaka's eyes froze wide. Dragons were notoriously avaricious of their mates and viciously fraught off any member of the same sex, regardless of species, when they approached a potential mate. Though Yusaka eased herself in knowing that a simple dragon wouldn't be of any trouble to her. After all, what threat was there in a mere beast? Maybe we should get going. 
The fireworks start soon, right? Ah yes. Yusaka said quickly. They finished off their small snack and went along the path of stalls. As Kunu skipped ahead of them, the rush of ongoing human traffic increased and the pathway became congested. Kunu, she heard him call out, much to her surprise. The young girl quickly scampered over to him and, unexpectedly, Ichigo leaned down and swept the young girl into his arms. Isaka looked on with minor surprise as Kunu wriggled briefly as she made herself comfortable and settled her arms around his neck. She even wrapped her furry snake around him and placed a mask, crafted in the image of the moon, so that it was tilted on the side of head. Isaka gave her a fond look of exasperation right before Ichigo did something to lurch Isaka's heart into her throat. He deftly snaked an arm around her waist and drew her towards him and Yusaka's cheek swiftly colored in hotness. She swallowed the thickness in her throat as his eyes sharpened and he allowed a fragment of his darkness to rise. The effect was almost instantaneous. Dormant evolutionary instincts awoke and the humans began to subconsciously shift away from his maleficent and cloying aura. Although, all of that went widely ignored by Yusaka as the heat of Ichigo's hand wound around her hip oozed past the silk fabric of her kimono. She snuck a glance at him. He was busy with entertaining Kunu's nonsense and did not appear to be paying attention to his arm resting on her. Yusaka flexed her fingers a few times in hesitation before she steered a step to the side and touched sides with him. Practically in an instant, his arm tightened as it drew her closer to him. Yusaka would spend the next five minutes grinning down at the ground, her earlier apprehension all but forgotten. As they settled down on a riverbank, Ichigo having conjured a small blanket for them to sit on, a sudden epiphany occurred to the ruler of Kyoto. With Kunu sitting between his legs and chattering away and with her leaning against him as his arm still rested on her side, Yusaka realized that the three of them must appear as what they secretly were. A family. The revelation brought a sense of euphoria that dispersed the long-standing tensions of the last few months. Ever since Amada Asusama's decree, she had been dreading the sort of person she had been entwined with. But she knew that regardless of his dark allegiances, Ichigo Kurosaki was a sincere young man. Looking at the way he brought a smile to her daughter's face tugged at her heart. A wrenching sensation of both longing and bliss. However tonight tonight would the moment. Once they returned home. Once Usaka tucked Kunu safely into bed, she would take Ichigo aside and tell him the truth. Would he be upset? Perhaps. But he was not a person of malicious vindictiveness. If anything, he would take it up with a matter Asusama who had taken him on as pseudo-adopted child. And given time, maybe just maybe she and Ichigo could have something. As a line of fire soared into the air and boomed into a magnificent display of patterned color, Kunu clapped giddily in Ichigo's lap as she let out a squeal of elation. A bright shower of sparks illuminating her pale skin, Yusaka inched her head onto his shoulder and allowed golden hair to spill over. She felt his hold on her solidify in an all-too-affectionate manner. Yusaka closed her eyes, content with the sound of bursting fireworks, of the thrilling laughter of her darling, and the soft breathing of her husband. A perfect moment, a picture caught in time for the rest of her days. A barely audible breath escaped her when she felt his chin nudge over the top of her head. Absolutely perfect. And that's when she felt it. A suffocating cold wind dredging over the entire park. Isaka immediately sat up straight, iron ramming itself through her spine as a monstrous presence thickened in the air. The absolute density of the power so evident that even the mortals around them noticed and began to grow disquiet. No, Ichigo breathed from beside her as his eyes remained locked on the sky. Far off and deep into the blackness of the sky, a churning darkness amassed in a swirling wrath. Slowly roiling forth, every few seconds or so, it erupted in a brilliant flash of purple and blue vaults. The wind ripped through the air and Yusaka held her hair down as it threatened to fray about in the whipping gales. There was something there in the sky. Something impossibly old and powerful. Something which Ichigo seemed to be quite familiar with. He let rip a frustrated growl as he brought forth a surge of power. Ani san Kunu looked up at him nervously. He gazed down at her, worry and guilt streaming through his eyes. I'm sorry Kunu. I'm so sorry. I'll make it up to you, I promise. While before she could protest, Ichigo passed a hand over Kunu's eyes and her daughter peacefully fell against his chest in blissful unconsciousness. Yusaka looked at her for a moment before turning a furious gaze at him. What are you doing? He didn't get a chance to respond as a blackened roar shattered the sky and sent the humans screaming. Fuck it all, he grunted as he thrust his hand and unleashed burst of magic that soared in all directions. It passed over her, absolutely ineffective, but the humans all fell in place as it hit them. Finding sleep in his woven enchantment. Isaka took Kunu as he gently passed her into her arms and stood. Carefully, Yusaka also stood and looked skywards in horror. Clouds, darker than even Susanaa's rage, swirled with a massive surge of electricity. Stay behind me, he said gruffly. And no matter what, don't look into her eyes. Before she could respond, Yusaka let out a shriek as she buried Kunu in her arms and turned around protectively. A pillar of thunder slammed into the earth, sending a wave of debris and lightning all around. 
It was only Ichigo's quick flaring of power that shielded the two Kikbi from the electrical onslaught. Turning a worried glance back, Yusaka followed Ichigo's furious gaze, and never had she seen him so upset in the short time she had known him, past a cloud of dust and arc of lightning. A single shape stepped forward, one that set Yusaka's heartbeat frantically. Centuries ago, new to the throne of Kyoto, she had briefly rested her eyes upon this creature during a visit to Rikjin's palace. A monstrous being older than even the sky palaces of Takamagahara. Isaka's eyes fell wide as long, shapely legs of amber cut through the flying dirt and currents of lightning. I've returned, my little master. Like a flood of power, her voice raged over Yusaka's ears, filling her with an ancient dread and terror. But it was her actual words that punctured her soul the deepest. Not her anyone but her. Diamat. Ichigo's voice barely leveling above a snarl, shattering whatever securities Yusaka had left. She laughed, a throaty sound that, despite filling her with fear, caused a heat to drift into her core. And it was then, despite his warning, Yusaka looked upon the full form of the Dragon King and met her eyes. Immediately, she was assailed by a crushing force, a fatal hunger that demanded her very soul. She felt a need to give in. A sense of appropriateness to bow down in submission to the ancient being. Every ounce of her will was being stripped from her. It was utterly petrifying. Petrifying and exhilarating. The spell was broken as Ichigo stepped in between them and blocked Yusaka's vision with his back. She gasped sharply, as if she were drenched in ice water, and Yusaka held onto her daughter for dear life. Shouldn't we return home, master? Her enchanting voice leveled with dark amusement. Ichigo took a hesitant step, slowly peering over his shoulder in remorse and mortification. I'm sorry I, I didn't think this would happen. He sent his gaze forward, and she felt the monster in him roar to life. And it won't happen again. As you wish. Darkness rolling of her tongue. He gave a defeated sigh and snapped his fingers, twisting a hole into the fabric of space and opening a portal to the underworld. I'll make it up to you. Both of you. I promise. He then put the full load of his fiery eyes on Tiamat who took it all in stride. We're leaving. Now. The dragon dipped her head and walked into the open pathway. Ichigo followed her, turning back to give her a forlorn look before disappearing into the void. The tear in space collapsed and with it the presence of the two behemoths. As the world righted itself, a cold whisper of the air drifted through Yusaka's ears. He's not coming back, he's sleeping with me. The wind carried on with a harsh laughter. Chapter 11. Tiamat. The sky didn't so much darken as it dulled under the ire of her master. Slowly losing its purplish tint and turning into a lifeless gray as malevolence ruptured reality. The newly born twin crescents dominating the horizon seemed to blur into a bland state, hiding away from an inevitable calamity. And it wasn't just the color of the world. Even the ambient sounds of the underworld seemingly drowned out and left only the leaden steps of her volcanic master. The sheer level of fury radiating from his back singed the carpets of Lucifer's castle and caused various flora within bases to wither into darkened embers. The scorching trace of demonic taint seared through her nostrils and left an ashen taste in her mouth. His current anger would have slaughtered any mortal unfortunate enough to come across him at the moment. Her eyes never strayed from his steeled shoulders as the shadows of the underworld convulsed in life and entwined themselves across her bare legs and feet with every step she took. For the first time in several millennia, Tiamat felt unadulterated fear course like venom through her veins and throb erratically against her skin. A being of her extraordinary age did not fear death. Rather, she was given a resolute reminder to the darkness beyond the inevitable. She opened her mouth to speak and, the moment a hint of breath escaped, a blast of scalding air thrashed through the corridor they were traversing. She let out a soft cry and rose her arms over stinging eyes, yet he continued ever on, doom falling with each step. Arms falling to her sides as she made to follow him Tiamat's lips twitched hesitantly as her gaze trailed after a resolute back. She noted the walls scorched with black and the windows of tall glass falling in a molten hiss on stone floors. In gloom, they continued on to his private quarters and, as he she walked past the threshold of the door, she saw him take a seat in his chair and begin to tap softly away at a smooth rectangular cut. With each finger stroke, the flat piece in front of him responded and brightened in light. It seemed he was quite content to ignore her. It was a shame that Dragon King Tiamat did not take kindly to being ignored. Little one eye, shut. Up. Another wave of power fell from him and pressed the fabric of space. Her eyes narrowed and indignation roared to life within her. Justifiable his anger may be, she would not allow any being to treat her this way. In all of history, no one had dared to silence her and walked away unscathed. A charge of static filled the air around her, and a low snarl crept from her chest. I will not be spoken to in awe. The muscles in his neck rippled as his eyes darted towards her, and Tiamat's knees crashed to the ground under the monstrous weight shattered over her. The shadows clawed into her and held her in place, making it impossible for her to turn away from the sight forced into her. Her master has eyes they burned. She could see them. She could hear them. Countless. Endless. Eternal. Bound in chain and filled with fire, they screamed and clawed their way out his eyes. 
Legion after legion pressed in a mass of twisted flesh and broken corpses. Eyes, torn from their sockets and filled with metal implements. Acid pumped into hearts and maggots gnawing into minds. She saw blood-encrusted hooks torn through sinew and crushed through joints. Entrails ripped from within and trampled upon by infernal steeds. Brim and winged, avenging one's ground bones beneath serrated edges and seared metal into skulls with rods molten. Skin peeled inch by inch with bloodied hands wielding crude and broken instruments. Fruit, turning blood into toxin, forced into shattered jowls and fingers of iron digging around spines and tearing them out bone by bone. And more. So. Much. More. A million souls screamed and Tiamat bore witness to their never-to-end suffering. And then they were gone. The fire no longer burning into her mind, Tiamat collapsed prone against the floor. Though her eyes never left her master's. Slowly, he pushed himself off his seat and came to kneel before her. Gaze once more hard and brown. Scorching no more. As his hand reached forward and his fingers dug through her mane of hair, Tiamat realized her lungs were aching for the need of air. Had her terror ceased even the subconscious functions of her mind? Had her lungs forgotten to breathe? Had her heart forgotten to press blood into her veins? Though it seemed not to matter as she felt her master's thumb struck against her cheek and a sudden rush of drowsiness overtook her. As her vision hazed and lids fell heavy, one last thought came to the ancient dragon as she fell into slumber. He really is an adorable abomination. The Chigo leaned back into his chair and put two fingers to his lips as his eyes swept over the question. He reached out and flipped a page as his line of sight sifted through the text. One satisfied, he sat straight again and typed his answer into the box provided. As his fingers fell away from the keyboard, he quietly read aloud the answer to himself and finally picked out any spelling or grammatical errors. Content with his effort, he dragged the mouse over to the submit button and clicked. Once the screen flashed and the page displayed loaded to another screen, Ichigo read over the new question and began the process all over again. For the next 20 minutes, he quietly did the assigned homework for his online schooling. Eventually, he completed the assignment and logged out of the online textbook. As he closed the window, Ichigo leaned back, stretched his arms and let out a tired sigh. He quietly brushed a tired hand over his eyes that missed it over in the sudden sensation over no longer having to stare at a bright screen. He allowed a cool trickle of demonic power to touch his eyes, and his high-speed regeneration repaired whatever damage had been done to his vision at staring a computer in dimly lit room. Ichigo's eyes then fell on a round stone roughly the size of a tennis ball sitting at the edge of his desk. He picked it up and tossed it lightly into the air before catching it. Turning it around with his fingers revealed a large cracked opening in the other side, and, even in the mutely lit room, the sapphire jewels glittered with a supernatural glow. A very familiar glow. He ran a hand through his hair while letting out a frustrated breath of air. Ichigo leaned further back into his chair and craned his neck toward his bed. And there she was. Lying on her side, still entirely nude, with her grey-white hair wildly falling over her shoulders and veiling her breasts. He had allowed his anger get the better of him once again, nearly tearing open a hell gate inside of his own bedroom in the process and virtually threw Tiamat into the abyss while he was at it. Still, the prideful dragon deserved to be knocked down a few pegs. Ichigo just hoped he hadn't caused her any psychological damage. Granted, he had no idea how the psyche of a millennia-old primordial worked. Could a being that was a literal embodiment of nature even be mentally injured? He knew all too well the horrors he had shown her. Over the last few months, Ichigo had come to grow quite accustomed to hell as it raged through him. With a passive recognition, Ichigo could easily find himself viewing the anathema to the world that was the infernal pit. And he had come to accept it in its entirety. Letting out another sigh, Ichigo pinched the bridge of his nose. It was a sad thing, he realized, when his life was simpler fighting off warriors of the undead and helping souls cross over into the afterlife. His eyes fell back to his hand and the G.O.D. it lightly gripped. Right, he muttered and snapped his fingers. Barely one second passed before there was a soft knock on his door. Enter. The bedroom door swung open and one of Grafia's many maids bowed in. May I be of service, my lord. Ichigo nearly let out another sigh. He had told the staff numerous times to simply refer to him by name, but their fear of the silver-haired lady of the house surpassed any order he would ever give. He held out the G.O.D. Sorry to bother you with this, but can you mail this for me? Generally speaking, he didn't like having others doing things for him however, Ichigo had little time to visit whatever passed as the post office in the underworld. The maid came forward and took the stone from him. Of course my lord. Where shall I send it to? Can you send it to my family in the human world? He paused and went to pick up a pen and loose sheet of paper. Here, let me write down the address for you. There is no need sir. He regarded her with a curious look as she bowed once more. You, heir, know where my family lives. Mistress Grafia is quite adamant the staff familiarize themselves with the manor residence as much as possible. Ichigo gave her an uncertain look. That's nice. Actually, he was quite uncomfortable with any member of the supernatural community knowing where his family lived. 
obviously, his father could take care of himself. Not to mention Urahara, Yuruchi and Tessai were quite the formidable defense of Karakura, but still. It wasn't as if they could keep an eye on his sisters at all times. Admittedly, Grafi undoubtedly held all the staff's loyalty in a firm grip. And if not their loyalty, the fearsome woman unquestionably held their souls. Truthfully, now that he put some thought into it, given Urahara's penchant for invading other people's privacy, he just might have an eye on his sisters at all times. Ichigo's brow furrowed. Right hat and clogs was due for a visit sometime soon in the near future. My lord. The maid looked at him tentatively. Hmm? Ah, right. Sorry spaced out for a second. She bowed, again. May I be of any other service? He shook his head. No, that's all, thank you. I live to serve, my lord. She probably does, in all truth. Ichigo thought to himself as she walked out the door and quietly closed it. He sighed as he returned to his laptop and began anew on a different homework assignment. Another full hour passed of Ichigo straining his eyes in the dark so to allow Tiamat a restful sleep and straining his brain so to finish a 500-word essay due at midnight tonight. So consumed was he with his work that he practically shot of his chair when his cell phone vibrated loudly against his desk. Surprise plainly etched onto his face, Ichigo picked up the sleek phone and his brows rose even further as he read the name on the caller ID. He flicked his thumb over the green icon and put the phone next to ear. Yo, Karen. His younger sister's voice came from the other side. Hey, Ichi Nai. How's it going? Fine, he said. Just doing a bit of homework. You? We're all okay. We were about to turn in for bed when your gift arrived. Ichigo paused. Gift. What gift? Wait a minute. He held out his phone and looked at the time. Little over an hour had passed and the rock had already gotten there. Abruptly, Ichigo felt like dropping his head onto the desk as he realized the maid must have gone and personally delivered it. It was really strange. The doorbell rang and when I answered, there was nobody there. Just this small gift-wrapped box with a note saying it was from you. A frown crossed Ichigo's lips. You shouldn't be answering the door late at night. He said sternly. Her voice came back in white and exasperated. I'm not a kid anymore, Ichi Nai. I'm 15 years old and at this age you were doing a lot crazier things than answering the door at night. He shook his head. I'm hardly the best example of leading a healthy, normal teenage life. Oh yeah? You'd rather I follow the footsteps of our old man? He sighed and rubbed his temples with one hand. I'd rather you live out your own life without any outside influence. She huffed on the other side of the line. It must be nice to live off on your own if you've forgotten the insanity that runs in this house. Ichigo's grip on his phone tightened. It was light, barely perceptible, but it was still there. An undercurrent of accusation and anger rang low in Karen's voice. He opened his mouth to say something, but couldn't find the right words, so he merely shut his eyes tightly. After a few moments passed, she called out. Ichi nai. Yeah, I'm still here. He opened his eyes and picked up a pen, fiddling with it absently. How's high school treating you and Yuzu? Annoying for the most part. Yuzu loves it of course, but most of the sports clubs suck here. You weren't kidding when you said they need all the help they can get. He chuckled as memories of various club captains begging him to join their teams popped into his mind. Yeah, they can get pretty annoying fast. Just make sure to say no once in a while, or else they'll start to take advantage of you and dump a bunch of expectations you don't need. She sighed into the phone again. I told you, I can take care of myself. Yeah, yeah, I know. He uttered softly. You don't need me to play big brother for you anymore. What? No, I didn't me erg, never mind. His brows knit as he barely made out a few words she began to mutter from her side. Foremost among them being idiot. Perrin? Seriously? What? He asked in confusion. Nothing, just you had to send a rock of all things. Couldn't you have found a better thing to send as a souvenir? He rolled his eyes at her blatant attempt to change the topic before his face fell into a scowl. Considering the sheer tribulations and headache involved with getting that rock. No. He really couldn't have found something better. Especially when bearing in mind the fact that the G.O.D. could probably put both her and Yuzu through college if they decided to sell it. Although, he wasn't about to tell them that. That would raise far too many uncomfortable questions as how he came to possess such a valuable thing. And where did you get something like that in the middle of the city? Shit. I, uh, got it from a friend in the geology department. Did his university even have a geology department? So you didn't even buy it. You just gifted another gift. You're so cheap, Ichi Nai. What? Hey. What on earth am I supposed to do with it anyway? I might as well send it to you guys. I bet at least Yuzu is appreciating a gift. I won't argue with you there. Karen said in vexation. She's been over the moon ever since it arrived. I don't understand why. It's just a shiny rock. A loud growl stole Ichigo's attention away from the phone, and he craned his neck around to see Tiamat toss and turn. What was that? Are you in a park somewhere? Um, no I'm at home. 
He absently responded as his eyes stayed fixed on the waking dragon and his hand dropped the pen he was toying with. Itchy nai, I wouldn't have called you if you were at home. I'd simply walk upstairs and hold a conversation like a normal person. He could practically picture Karen all her eyes. No, not the house. I meant my apartment. The Amat's waning expression of sleep so easily captured his attention, he completely missed the discontent in Karen's words. Oh your apartment. The Dragon King's eyes quivered as she slowly pushed herself up onto her elbows. Look, Karen, I have to go. Talk to you later. Wait. Itchy Nai, when are you coming ba? The Chigo thoughtlessly hung up as Tiamat sat up on the edge of the bed and blinked away the soft echoes of dream and sleep from her mean. Finally, she looked up at him, her stare blank and void of emotion. Several moments of silence passed, broken only when she made the first utterance. You are surprisingly cruel, little one. The twinge of guilt passed through him, though he had the tact not to show it. I think. He considered his words slowly. That we both need to draw some lines. If this is going to work out, I mean. She slowly raised one hand and pushed her hair away to grip the side of her head. A grim smile began to play across her lips. They the screams they will not go away. She gave a mirthless laugh and shook her head. I will have to erase my own memories if I am to find peace in the years to come. If it's any consolation, Aichigo gave a fatigued sigh as he leaned forward, wrung his hands and placed his elbows on his knees. I am sorry. I took it too far. As I have said. You are surprisingly cruel. Suddenly, her eyes became mournful and pitying, if anything. Yet, nevertheless, my nurturing aspect cannot help but weep for the child that you are. He frowned considerably. I'm not a child. She smiled at him, one filled with ruined sorrow. His frown grew even more prominent. That look it did not suit her at all. How old are you, little one? Truly, what span of the pages of history have you spent in existence? I'm 19. He scratched the side of his head. Though thanks to extenuating circumstances, I'm technically a year older. Again, she shook her head contritely. Twenty simple years, she said softly. Whereas my life has crossed well over twenty millennia. Yet still, I cannot bear the horror that so naturally you wield. Even as you sit before me now, how much of your current self will remain in the centuries to come, I wonder. Wholly surprised by her words, Ichigo fell completely silent. Centuries to come. He honestly had not given any thought to it. It hadn't actually occurred to him that he was technically immortal now. The Amat rose from the mattress, her weight leaving a small imprint that slowly began to fill itself. She stood in front of him, and Ichigo noted the weariness that shouldn't have been present whatsoever. The sense of tiredness which he had put on her features. Slowly, she lowered herself onto his lap and turned around, wrapping her arms around his neck as she put their foreheads together. These lines of yours, she spoke delicately. I believe some understanding in regard to the other is necessary for them to take shape. What do you suggest? He unthinkingly kept her upright by placing both his hands under her shoulder blades and pressing her close. Their noses touched and he felt her sea breeze breath break over his lips. She hummed deeply. In an age so long ago, one where humanity had not yet learned to give language form and letter, I first took breath and broke from the oceans. Willed to life by the energies running rampart in primal times. Her sapphire luster glowed warmly into his own two eyes. Young and naive, I took steps onto land, staring in childish marvel at all things new and alien. I am primordial ascendant yet still, it was the most wondrous of all sights to me despite pre-deposited understanding. Her voice fell low, into pleasing thrum. As time marched on, uncared for by my undying eyes, I came across another the same as me. Arisen from the waters fresh and sweet, I discovered another primordial. So similar in nature, we could not help but spend idle pleasure in each other's company. Morning gave way to night. Night to morning. How long, even I do not know, but we stayed with one another. As his eyes bored into hers, she brought up the fingers of one hand and softly traced his lips. Understand, to the firstborn, names mean not. We are as what we came from. To us, that is enough. But name each other we did. Tiamati gave me an abzu, I, to him. She gave a light laugh, fleeting yet impossibly deep. It was a musical sound releasing an endless number of years' worth of memories. Ichigo's hold on her tightened as he swallowed thickly. What we had, in each other's companionship, transcended the customary understanding of the force known as love. We were truly as one. Our joy as one, our sorrow as one and even our rage poured together. Ichigo felt Tiamat's hands begin to sift through his hair. The pads of her touch drifting and sweeping over the roots of his orange strands. The nails of one of his hands traced up and down the naked arc of her spine. She shuddered against his touch and yet, he did not stop. What happened? He asked somberly. We had children. She smiled with ivory. Numerous children. Whom we loved and cherished. I suckled them at my breast and gave them my own strength. My own life. She gave another laugh, this one devoid of any joy. White tresses fell over him as she rubbed her head against his. Yet what arrogant children they came to be. Daring to call themselves gods. 
demanding the mortals to worship them. Defiant to the natural laws even as the creator had already forged countless worlds in this life and others, all at the barest of whims. Most known to all realms, the very darkness within you. She was right. Ichigo knew because Hell acknowledged her words. We turned a blind eye to their conceit. What matter was it to us, what became of transient mortals doomed to die? They turned on you. He whispered softly, horror inducing a shadowed understanding. Indeed. The strokes through his hair seeming almost therapeutic for her. Coveting their father's throne, they slew him in his sleep. I fell into madness and went to my birthplace. Only to return with my new children. Dragons, filled with hate and venom in their veins. And others as well. Camaraderie set through Eon's past. You lost, didn't you? She softly nudged her nose against his. Not immediately, no. For decades, my children warred against one another. My children born to my husband and my children born to my hate. Yet the arrogant children committed a terrible folly. What did they do? Ichigo asked her as she brushed his bangs away. One of the dragons I birthed, a daughter, fell in love with another being of great and terrible power. With him, she had a daughter of her own, but my prideful brood slaughtered both her and my grandchild. Hiamat took a deep breath, a sudden rush of emotion waving through the blue of her eyes. Her lover came upon the battlefield and he rained fire and death from the skies. I was present then and greatly injured from his rage. The veil of pain twisted across her face and Ichigo realized, for her prideful self to openly admit to an injury, it must really have been quite severe. My traitorous issue took advantage of my injuries and I was slain, just as they had done with Abzu. Ichigo suddenly leaned back and stared. If that was true, how was the woman in his arms now? But but then. How do I still yet breathe? A teasing inflection breaking through the sea of roiling emotions. My husband was utterly destroyed, his essence returned to the world. But my children still coveted the power we wielded. They bound my spirit to my flesh and cut my body to pieces. Ichigo's mouth fell agape as a dark repugnance rose along bile. The very idea that someone could betray their own mother so completely fell as such an anathema to him that he could only bite the inside of his cheek and strengthen his hold on Tiamat more securely. They took my corpse and scattered its pieces through earth and sky. My eyes, ever flowing with vengeful tears, became the rivers unbroken in their forgery of paradise. My blood soaked into the land to bless it with my fertility. My bones became the foundation of their empires. My skin became the banners that hung from their palaces. Ichigo's grip on Tiamat grew so solid, he practically crushed the woman towards him while his teeth grit painfully. She wasn't lying to him. The familiar bond practically screaming at him with several centuries worth of imprisonment and misery from her side of the link. He swallowed audibly and barely ground out his words. How did I come to be free? She finished for him as she dropped her head onto his shoulder and softly shut her eyes. He gave a strained nod. For centuries I wallowed in despair. Hope but a feeble word without any meaning. But I never forgot, even in my desolation. I remembered my husband, the time and memories we forged. My sole consolation his smile and touch within my dreams. And it was those dreams that called to their master. Their master? His eyebrows knitted in confusion. Since time immemorial has it been called as such. Recorded in even the oldest civilizations of the supernatural as a fleeting force, unstoppable and unknowable. We called it the dream. The dream? Some familiarity tugged at Ichigo's mind, but he couldn't place it. She nodded into his shoulder, her cheek rubbing softly against the bone of his collar. Lifting my spirit from its captivity, the dream crafted me a new body. One in the image of a dragon and granted me life anew. How's that even possible? The dream cares little for the way of the world. Drifting between illusion and reality, it is ever in a state of duality. She nuzzled her head deeper against his shoulder, and Ichigo reached up with one hand to comb his fingers through her hair. What happened afterwards? My power was tremendously weakened and still is. No longer a true primordial I became the first monarch amongst Wormkin. I could no longer take my revenge on my traitorous children, diminished that I was. Though time proved I did not need to. What do you mean? Without my power, they came to decline. Anatolia to the north, led by my old ally Ishtar, made war on them. Always willing to wage strife, set summoned waves of chaos from the sands of Egypt and sent forth his dark armies. The final stroke fell when the one who called himself the Heavenly Father arose to power. He and his angels eradicated the kin slayers. As I said upon our initial meeting, I saw Azazel burn Babylon. She gave a hearty laugh. When he fell, stained and beautifully black, I went to him and rewarded him greatly. Rewarded him? Ichigo's mouth twisted and, unbeknownst to him, embers sparked in his eyes. An eager and capable child that one. She let her fingers fall through the strands of his hair and set them tapping at the nape of his neck. Though he was not very attentive as a lover and often lost himself in his own mind. A strange habit for one of his ilk. He shifted her in his arms, noticing how her legs were uncomfortable dangling over the arm of his chair. 
the brushing of her nose at the base of his throat was her way of thanking him for his consideration, or he assumed as much. Azazel. A name he heard often enough from both Grafia and Serzich's. The Crimson Lucifer often spoke of the Governor of the Fallen with hints of admiration. After the sealing of the Heavenly Two, Azazel gave the order to withdraw, as his race had taken substantial losses against the vicious onslaught of the enraged dragons. Seeing the Fallen lower their spears, Heaven and Hell did the same, no longer willing to wage a war that had brought nothing but untold amounts of destruction and ruin. The Great War ended with the leaders of all sides either severely crippled or outright dead. Serzich has said that Azazel's efforts had been what kept the war from erupting once again due to old grudges and prejudice. The twelve-winged fallen was known for being lazy, perverse and eccentric beyond reason, and, on top of that, he was genius without peer that tended to mass-produce various inventions. And on top of that, he had history with a dark-skinned beauty. Namely, the one in his arms. If the man is blonde and has stubble on his chin, then Lucifer save us all he just might be your Ahara's father. He turned his gaze downwards, towards the resting dragon king. At his movement, she looked up at him demurely, and Ichigo felt something twist in his gut. He was supposed to be angry with her. Not admiring how appealing she was with the whole innocence look. He rubbed a hand down her shoulder and to her elbow. What was the name of that being? The one who injured you? The harshness swept away the supple light in her eyes, and her sapphire orbs glittered in hardness. His name is Drag. Still, she could hear the echoes of torment ringing through her skull. Her master had delivered his vengeance with a brand that should have been all too obvious to her from the beginning. It was terrifying and nerve-wracking to think that he could transition from drowning her in endless nightmare and drag forth the greatest of her miseries and fears to cradling her gently and almost lovingly in his arms. Thousands of years had passed since her freedom at the hands of the Ultimate One, and she had learned to let go of her past, if not, lock it away at least. In all honesty, the murder of her husband, the war she waged and her subsequent imprisonment no longer meant anything to her. She had moved away from that period of time. Utterly hiding away the primordial aspect and immersing herself in the existence known as a dragon. Reveling in the skies and rejoicing with every drop of rain that fell on her hide. Of course, her master so easily destroyed it all. With one motion of haunting eyes, he had so fantastically annihilated an entire age's worth of recovery and healing. His chest rumbled in a hollow reverberation, and Tiamat kept gazing into those mirthless orbs of earth and hue. Of course. He shook his head with a ponderous quirk of the lips. It always comes back to those two, doesn't it? Her lids fell ever so slightly as she observed him. Did he know something of Drake's involvement of events so long ago he was but a strand of DNA in his primitive ancestors? Or was he merely pointing out the fact that her elder two kin had a magnificent pattern of imprinting their names through various points in history with fire and calamity? Is there any point in history where those two weren't making trouble for the rest of the world? His sardonic query more himself than her. She shifted her bottom against his thighs, faintly noticing with amusement the sudden sensation of his hardening member. Regardless of the atmosphere or the nature of their discussion, she was nude, and they were pressed quite closely to one another. If anything, she'd look back at this memory in affront if she didn't manage to get a reaction out of him in that manner. Diamat was as much fertility and sex as she was the raging seas. She tightened her hold around his neck and raised herself, meeting him at eye level. Albion and Drake are older than even I. No one truly knows their origin save for, perhaps, the divine pair. There is even a telling that the heavenly two came from another world after they destroyed their own. Another world. Her master's brows crept high in wonder. Hmm. She pressed her lips to his jaw and purred against his warm skin. There are many worlds in existence. Various realities following their own laws entirely alien to ours. For where do you think the fire within you came? All of creation is but an uncharted sea. Consisting of varying depths and forged from impossible hues. A rhyme without a reason. That's actually not that surprising. His face settled into a relaxed state and she smiled onto his cheek. Another silence settled between the two of them, and Tiamat kept her lips pressed to his face. Trailing her content smile from his jaw to the corner of his mouth and up to under his eye. The shudder passed through her as he trailed heated fingers down his spine. He had done it before, earlier during her tale. And, quite frankly, she liked it. She leaned her face away from his, and he turned to meet her eyes. The tips of their noses touching, her serpentine stare traced the thin line of his lips. Tell me little one, do you believe that you know me now? that our particular limitations may now be shaped yet produce a thing sturdier betwixt us. He raised a brow. Do I think I know you now? He snorted. Not at all. There's still so much more to learn about a person than just that one story. But I think we're getting there. She gave him a slight smile filled with sincerity. Then, I believe it is your turn to regale me with your life. One of his arms came loose from her back and brushed away hair from his brow before settling around her once more. A habit of his, she realized. Well, I don't have anything quite dramatic as yours or long for that matter. She playfully nudged him with her chin at his teasing jibe. 
but remember when you asked me last night about having a lover and all that. When I kind of stopped you from practically molesting me. Tiamat gave him a minor glare. I am Tiamat. I have no need to molest anyone. Men and women fall to their knees before me, begging for carnal pleasure. And you set your hands on me quite easily enough, thank you very much. Yeah yeah, I get that. He rolled his eyes. Anyways, it had less to do with me not finding you attractive. Here he paused and a slight color rose to his cheeks. I think that the opposite has been established quite effectively. She gave a heavy nod, fighting the smile threatening to split her lips. Judging by his mild stare, she wasn't succeeding all too well. And more to do with the fact I'm not really into casual relationships. She blinked and tilted her chin. I do not understand. This. He looked her up and down while gesturing with one hand. Whatever this is, we agreed that it's temporary at best. And the way you seem to be jumping right into it well whatever it is, kinda cheapens the whole the deal for me. Makes it seem like a sham. The fine, white, brow arched. Little one, you do realize that you have essentially referred to me as a whore. His eyes widened comically in panic, and he pushed her back to look at her in full. What? No, no. That's not what I meant at all. Damn it, how do I explain this? She began a throaty laugh that only increased in volume at his bewildered look. She settled both hands on his mouth and gently placed a smiling kiss over her fingers. The jest, little master. Her eyes sparkled with mischief. Though with high standards, a horror I do not mind being called. I have taken many to bed across the eons. Hundreds, perhaps even thousands. You will find that I, along with several of our immortal contemporaries, find little meaning in copulation beyond physical bliss. She felt his mouth move behind her hands, but she shook her head, willing him to allow her to finish. Which is the exact opposite of how you feel, I understand. To you, it should be a beautiful thing of love and empathy. But understand this, to one of my age, love is a thing purely of the heart and mind. When I love, I love in full. Regardless of shape and form, of bodily pleasure and ecstasy, love to me is a very different thing than it is to you. In certain regards, of course. Her hands fell away and a singular confusion fell across his face. In certain regards. His hand rose to brush away his hair once more, however, this time she caught it before it initiated the act. She brought the arm down and reached out with her other hand. Carefully, she pressed her thumb to his hairline and pushed the hair in a roguish wave, rather than its straight fall. Love takes many forms. My husband and I did not spend endless hours in bed, fornicating and bringing each other to the ends of carnal desire. Well perhaps on some occasion we did. The stirring of a blush in his face caused her to let out a low chuckle. But my greatest memories are when we would simply dine with one another. Just the act of taking nourishment in one another's company, the act of wanting to exist with him, it was the absolute joy of my time in that life. She ran a finger under his jaw and smirked. Though I do believe you were about to regale me with a tale of yours. I assume it is the source of your hesitancy. He blinked twice. Oh right. He cleared his throat and sent his gaze upwards in thought. It was about a year ago, I had just left home to begin the first year of college. Tiamat had no idea what a college was, but she did not feel the need to interrupt him again. It's a place of academic study, in case you're wondering. He added with a quick look. Her lips curled. The familiar bond was stronger than she realized if their thoughts were touching on even a subconscious level. Several classmates of mine dragged me out for a get-together with other students from our major. I didn't really want to go but, stubborn bastards. Anyways, there was a lot of heavy drinking involved, I didn't partake, and one of my classmates asked me to escort a rather drunk girl to her apartment. Naturally you accepted. She said with a knowing smile. His lips quirked in a brief frown. Yeah and once we hey. Where are you going? Tiamat slid off his lap and stretched her arms upward. Giving her master a rather blatant and generous view of her own magnificence. She gathered her hair in both hands and threw it over her shoulder before grabbing his hand and pulling him from the chair. I enjoy the sensation of your body. His face went flat crimson. But the position is hardly comfortable for extended periods of time. She led him to bed and, quite effectively, tossed him over onto it. Whoa. The mattress heaved in a fluff as he soared through the air and fell flat on his back, laying prone with her climbing up to straddle him quickly enough. Did, did you just judo throw me onto the bed? Tiamat leaned across his chest, settling her mean across the fabric of his garment and inhaled his sharp scent of smoke. You may continue. She said after a moment. Gee, thanks. The smirk curved as his blatant irritation fell on her ears. It curved even further as she felt one his hand settle across her hip and the other beneath on the curve of her neck. Her cheek rubbed softly against his chest as the hand on her hip casually traced her back and spread a velvet warmth. Where was I? You were taking the intoxicated human female home. There was a pregnant pause where he deftly broke it with a dry tone. Do you have to say it like that? You make it sound like I'm planning something nefarious. Continue, little one. His chest fell beneath her as he heaved a sigh. Right, so I took her home and in her drunk state she invited me inside. 
and you refused as the perfect member of the gentry you are. You want to tell this story instead. She merely laughed gently in response. Anyways, I said no and went out to live my merry life. She let out a wry snort at the thought of her master living out a meager human life. Young he may be, but an extraordinary gravity centered with him in regards to the weavings of fate and destiny. Four days later she tracks me down and apologizes for the trouble and thanks me for not taking advantage of her inebriation. Said it was the sweetest and stupidest thing she'd ever have a guy do for her. Tiamat raised a curious brow and spoke into his shirt. She thought it foolish that you did not take advantage of her. He quickly clarified. It'd be a few weeks later that I found out waking up with a hangover and a complete stranger in bed wasn't an unknown experience to her. So she apologized, thanked me, and then asked if I'd be willing to give her a second chance at a better first impression. I said yes and we began dating. Dating? You set dates on a calendar? The context was utterly lost on her. He fell silent at her question, most likely attempting to find a way to properly explain the foreign concept. In this day and age, humans don't have the time or patience to go through a full, uh, courting process. His hand lifted from her neck and she heard the shifting of hair before it settled back onto her. So instead, we sorry, they set up prearranged times to get to know one another as well as to show affection for each other. It also doesn't cut too much time into an ever-growing professional lifestyle. How novel. Tiamat tapped her fingers across his shoulder as she considered the strange human trial. Would you like to attempt this dating with me, my master? He stiffened considerably and she felt his chest shake as he began to cough. Ah uh, how about we discuss that later. As you say. She stopped tapping and began to draw circles. He cleared his throat. As I was saying, she asked me to date her and I really didn't see a reason to say no, so I said yes. It took her three weeks to convince me to have sex with her. The Amat blinked and raised her head, barely making out his eyes past his jaw. I spent every day with her for the next three months and we made love to each other nearly every single one of those days. At least I thought we were making love. Understanding filled Tiamat and his previous sentiments made all too much sense to her now. Lying in my bed one day, I quipped how fast our relationship became physical. She shrugged it off and said that's how casual sex works. And that was it for her. We were just fucking. It didn't go beyond that. His arms fell from around her as Tiamat pushed herself up and regarded her master with a sympathetic stare. Oh little one, the wretched child broke your heart didn't she? There was no inflection in his voice and his expression remained neutral. A week later, I told her I wanted to break up. I wanted to end our relationship I mean. She didn't even really care. All she did was say it was fun while it lasted and to look her up in the future if I wanted a good lay. She smiled and kissed me goodbye and I've never spoken to her since. He merely shrugged and continued on. I got over it well enough but I realized that just sex was not what I wanted. I was asked out by several girls after that however, I felt like unless I felt something first, I wouldn't go for it. Half a year later I met Serzich's and here we are. I am proud of you, little one. Tiamat's eyes shone with a dark glow as she reached out and touched a hand to his cheek. Many young ones lose themselves to despair at the break of such an artifice. Yeah well, I've dealt with more than a few reality shattering revelation in my time. I mean, little over five years ago, I was an average human. For the most part anyways. I'm hardly going to color my world blackened because of one disappointment. A little smile came to her lips. Well said. She followed his gaze as he turned his head to the side and her sight settled onto the machine displaying the time. It was well past the hour of midnight. Her master leaned his head fully into pillow and closed his eyes. A slight frown downturned his mouth after a moment and he patted the spot beside him. Come on. It's best we get what little sleep we can. I've got things to do tomorrow and I need to get you a wardrobe. You've been walking around naked for nearly two days now. She gave a throaty purr and leaned down to nuzzle his neck, tasting the spot where she could feel his heartbeat accelerate. Sleep. We never did draw those lines of yours and I don't particularly feel the need to find suitable garments. Or are you not satisfied with staring at my majestic form all day? We, he spoke with a certain difficulty as he avoided her eyes. Are going to sleep. At least I am. Actually, I think I'm going to send you away. I let you have your way last night, but you're a big girl. I'm sure you can sleep on your own. She willed her power into her eyes and stared at him hard. He quickly looked away in uncertainty and she gave a deep laugh as she dragged a single nail from his chin and down to his throat. Stopping just above his sternum, Tiamat leaned back, sitting across his waist, and gave him a dark, appraising look. I will not be going anywhere my master. Not for tonight, at least. She smiled into his scowl. I'm afraid that only near you are the haunting screams within my mind subdued. His expression fell quickly enough and guilt flashed through his eyes. If I am to get any sleep, then it will be in your company. Preferably, your company alone. His eyes fell away from her and he ran a tired hand through his hair. Sorry I really didn't mean to take it that far. 
I know. She nodded as she bit her lower lip, fighting the twitching smile. Wait a minute didn't you say you could erase those memories? So he finally remembered. I did. She nodded. But I will not. You want to remember all that. He looked at her incredulously. I do. Why? Apparently, he still underestimated her quite a bit. A slow baring of ivory teeth overcame her countenance. She would teach him well. Because, my master. This way you have no choice but to let me stay near you at all times. His mouth fell open, and she greatly relished the sheer disbelief he was displaying in face of her audacity. You're seriously going to use my guilt, and possibly your sanity, to get what you want, the hell is wrong with you? Hell is exactly what is wrong with me, little one. He flinched quite visibly. And I warned you, there is little more to fear than the cunning of the dragon. He put a hand over his eyes before taking a deep breath and rubbing his face tiredly with both hands. She stared for a minute, reveling in her victory before his hands fell away, and a dangerous smirk of his own spread across his lips. You want to follow me everywhere? Fine. The glint in his eyes honing quite dangerously. You can come and apologize to Yasaka with me tomorrow when I go back to Kyoto. Ichigo winced painfully as Tiamat's nails dug into his shoulder for the second time today he realized. The ancient dragon let out a dangerous growl as her gorgeous features twisted into a fierce snarl. Okay maybe attacking her pride wasn't the smartest thing to do. I will do no such thing. She snapped at him. For the first time, Ichigo noticed how sharp looking her teeth actually were. Her sapphire blues collapsed into slits and he felt an ecstatic charge run up his arms. I would sooner devour that overgrown woodland creature than bend my knee to her. Immediately Ichigo placed both of hands on her back, completely ignoring the charge of voltage assaulting his skin, and began to brush in soothing circles. If there was one thing he noticed about Tiamat, it was that physical touch went a long way in pleasing her mood. Easy there. He placed one hand to her neck and pulled her down to him. She resisted at first, but eventually leaned far enough to have her scorned face hover inches above. I wasn't serious, I was simply joking. I don't honestly expect you of all people to apologize. Another growl, softer but no less fear-inducing, escaped her throat, and the undercurrent of anger still filled the air. Humph. Her nails retracted from him shoulders, and he felt the spill of blood trail across his shirt. That's it. First chance I get, I'm spending all day learning how to activate my hiero. He continued to rub her as she sat back up, though closer onto his abdominals, so that he could carry on his ministrations. I will not apologize to anyone. She repeated with lessened vehemence as her glare fell back on him. And I do not think you will either. Ichigo rolled his eyes. You can't tell me what I can or can't do. She raised a defiant and challenging brow. Can't I? The bed shook as a heavy dose of demonic energy fell out of him. Ichigo summoned forth the nightmare once again, though keeping it in check and not allowing it to break the surface. Tiamat shrunk back and nearly fell off him had he not gripped her around the waist. The shadows screamed to life, brimstone filled the air, and Ichigo forced a demon awake. There was a limit to how much of her possessive nature he would allow, after all. No, you can't. Fiery crimson seared into wavering sapphire yet, when she began to quiver and lose focus in her gaze, Ichigo closed the floodgates and sat up. Carefully, he pulled her towards him, doing his best to ignore her nudity, and put their brows together. Breathe. He took a second to appreciate the irony of repeating her very first words to him back to her. The amat let out a small gasp of air. Shaking fingers spread wide as they gripped his face, and she leaned more of her weight against him. A few moments passed before she finally met his eyes and spoke ever so quietly. I think I'd prefer to go to sleep now. He regarded her for a moment. It was a shame that she had chosen to see reason after he had allowed his inner devil to take hold. There would be little mercy to be found from him in the next few minutes. Why are you so adamant against my association with Yasaka? Despite her dazed state, she still managed to give him a cultured look of incredulity. You know why. Is there any other reason? His voice dark and crimson eyes searching. Gently, she mouthed no and shook her head. Ichigo closed his eyes, taking a deep breath and tasting her scent. That oceanic wind that seemed to flit from her silken shock of hair. Taking very great care, Ichigo lifted Tiamat onto his chest and turned her over. This way, he was hanging over her as she lay against the bed and pillows. A reversal from their customary position. How far are you going to take this Tiamat? Darkness receded yet his fire continued to burn around them. Her fingers still gripped his face and, if anything, their clutch grew even tauter. He felt static as her silken legs slid and melted against his own. I chose you. It was my decision to bind us together. Her voice still shook, though remained as enticing as ever. And? He tolously prodded. I see your heart, little one. I know how you perceive the vulpine child. I will not allow what I have claimed be taken. If I have to throw you onto the sun's altar and have my way with you as she watches on, so be it. As a storm gathered in her once more, Ichigo called on the darkness, and she cried out as if he threw her in rhyme. Almost tenderly, Ichigo gripped both of Tiamat's hands and pried them away from his face. 
What am I going to do with you? He whispered as he brought both of her hands into one of his and pinned them above her head. All the world screamed around her, and Tiamat brought forth every ounce of her primordial aspect, willing to block out the dread seeping out of his eyes. I think, he said slowly as he cupped her face, forcing their gazes to remain locked with one another, and brushed long strands of hair away with his thumb. I need to put you back to sleep. Huh, Tiamat. He slowly spread her name out and she shivered in response. Her breathing hitched as his slowed to nearly non-existent. Her blood pounded in her ears while souls screamed in his. Her touch was charged while his seared. Defiant to the end, Dragon King Tiamat licked her lips as trepidation filled her every pore. You still owe me a good night kiss. Ichigo paused but quickly let loose a dark chuckle that sent flavored smoke over her face. The back of his free hand trailed across a delicate jaw and his fingers lifted an insolent chin. All of hell smiled down. And Ichigo kissed Tiamat. Chapter 12. Fairy Tale. Ichigo's mouth twisted sourly as he shut the refrigerator door rather heavily. My lord, please. One of many maids hesitantly reached out to grab the carton of milk from his hand, but a single withering glare from him stopped her dead in her tracks. Beak. She practically jumped back as her skin lost what little color it possessed to begin with. Grafia's staff were trained to do nearly every task for the residents of the castle, regardless of how trivial it was. Especially how trivial it was. The more simple the task, the greater the need for having someone else complete it for you. The laziness of his newfound species was appalling in certain regards. And, while he had yet to meet with any of Serzich's contemporaries, he dreaded the inevitable discovery of the sheer apathy for life that was Falbia Masmadius. The current sin of sloth and supreme commander of the underworld was said to drain the vitality and drive from people by simply being in the same vicinity as them. Ichigo shook his head in wonder as he deposited himself on a barstool at the kitchen counter. He took a quick glance at the maid who was still shaking and casting nervous glances around the corners. My lord, you are going to get me in trouble. Breakfast has already been prepared. And if it does not suit your taste I am more than willing to make something else for your pleasure. Ichigo rolled his eyes as he poured the milk. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were accusing me of being incapable of making myself a bowl of cereal. He drawled lazily. Her eyes widened and she began to shake her head vigorously. No. Of course not. It's just Mistress Grafia is quite strict in these matters and. Ichigo tuned her out as he neatly shoved a spoonful of breakfast into his mouth. If Grafia told the staff to jump, they'd be touching the moon before she even finished her sentence. It was in plain obedience that marked the staff at Lucifer's residence. It was downright submission. There were no questions asked, no hesitancy taken place, and no semblance of challenge to even consider. The silver-haired queen ruled with absolute authority. There was a reason, after all, that the denizens of darkness had aptly named the Lady of Lucifer as the Devourer Queen and Tyrant of Rhyme. Grafia herself would have taken the title of Leviathan had Seraphal not defeated her, albeit, just barely. In one of the many training sessions Serzich's held to develop a synergy amongst his peerage, Ichigo had witnessed his queen layer dozens of acres of land and thick sheets of demonic ice, with but a delicate wave of her hand. Only with his strength fully unrestrained could Ichigo actually stand up to the monstrous power of a Satan-class enemy, and Grafia was firmly entrenched within the ranks of the demon lords. So. Ichigo chewed out, effectively cutting the still-chattering maid off. How old are you? Eh? The maid pointed a startled finger at herself and, at his nod, said, I'm 16, sir. One his brows rose in surprise. So you're new here then? Uh, yes my lord. I only began working at the castle this month, she said with a confirming nod. Well that explains it Ichigo thought bemusedly. Most of the staff knew better than to argue with him, having become quite adjusted to the eccentricities of Serzich's peerage. For the girl to try to convince him otherwise, she must be rather new to the job. Hang on. His brow furrowed as a sudden thought occurred to him. You're 16 and you're working here? Shouldn't you be in school? Ah yes. I work here on the weekends. Oh well, anyways, if Grafian E gives you any trouble just tell her to take it up with me. He said while returning his attention to his now empty bowl. Tell mistress to take it up. Putting a scandalized hand to her mouth and whispering to herself, the poor girl turned a sickly shade of green. He lightly shook his head as he poured himself some more cereal. He glanced over the walls and laid his eyes on the clock. He turned an impassive gaze towards the maid as he slowly chewed a new morsel and swallowed. Out of curiosity, have you eaten breakfast? He had risen early today, well before sunrise, as sleep seemed to elude him for the majority of the night. His familiar was quite disgruntled at having to lose her self-dubbed heater in the early hours. Admittedly, it had been quite the trial escaping from the dastardly clutches of the Dragon King. The damned woman refused to allow him out of bed and had locked onto him with both arms and legs. He just had to land himself the single most dangerous familiar in the underworld, who, on top of every other headache, just happened to be a cuddler. As she opened her mouth, her stomach answered with a definite and quite audible growl. Her cheeks flared red and she let out a soft mutter. 
Breakfast for servants is at 6.30. His mouth pressed in a thin line, noting how that was still fairly some time away. He reached out with his fingers and grasped an apple from a filled bowl of fruit. Turning it over in his palm, he idly tossed it towards the girl. Wow. She fumbled around as she barely managed to catch it. After several moments of her looking back and forth from the apple to him, Ichigo leaned his cheek onto his fist and fixed her with a dry stare. You're supposed to eat it. But but but. You're not going to get in trouble because I tempted you with an apple. Ichigo rolled his eyes once more and absently dipped his spoon back into the bowl. When he moved to pick it back up, he noted with surprise just how much heavier it seemed. He looked down with no small confusion, only to find the bowl and the entirety of its contents frozen in one large heap of ice. With a startled cry from the maid, it didn't take too much deductive prowess to find out why his breakfast was now a freezing chunk of rice flakes and ceramic. Initially annoyed, when his brown eyes swept onto silvers of ire and frost, he felt a small part of him poking at his common sense and telling him to bolt. Unfortunately for that small part of him, he decided to hold his ground and not flinch away from the angry, and did he ever use that term lightly, maid. Me Mistress Grafia. The look at the teenage devil filled him sympathy as Grafia, standing with arms crossed and expression chillingly neutral, turned a dark gaze onto her and narrowed her eyes even further. The maid shook in place and lost all color as frosted eyes zeroed onto the innocent apple lying in her shaking hands. Young lady. Grafia's even in neutral inflection making the weight of her words all the more terrible. By no means was my ignoring of your age or inexperience in hiring you a show of lenience. If anything, I expected a certain standard of higher execution. The apple was immediately dropped on the counter, and the maid bent to the perfect 90-degree angle, much to Ichigo's amusement. My deepest apologies, Mistress Grafia. I, I can assure you that it won't happen again. Ichigo had to hand it to her. Despite the slight shake in her voice, the girl was still fully conscious and capable of wording coherent sentences. Serzich's would have fallen onto all fours, in tears, by now. See to a dozen, Grafia said with full steel and edge. Now off to your morning duties. Resting his chin in the palm of hand and letting a slight smile play across lips, Ichigo called out to the maid. Hold on for a second. She stopped in her tracks and turned around hesitantly. Ichigo's smile grew fractionally before he turned towards Grafia. If there's anyone to blame me san it'd be me. I'm the one who tied her up in conversation and ended up offering food while she was on the job. Be that as it may. Grafia's lips thinned in a very reserved line, and she turned towards the young girl. A maid must always be aware of her duties and proper standing in accordance with those she serves. Yes ma'am. The younger maid nodded vigorously. Grafia gave a cool nod as her eyes fell back to Ichigo. Very well, you may go and you may take the apple as well. The girl looked momentarily stunned before she blushed deeply and quickly uttered a thank you while running out of the kitchen, though not before snatching up the apple. Ichigo gave a low chuckle as he watched the flustered girl flounder away however, his laugh quickly turned into a cry of pain. Ow. That hurts. Ichigo's face twisted further in pain as Grafia had reached over with a hand and grabbed his ear, giving it an excruciating twist. I would thank you kindly enough if you do not undermine my own authority in front of my staff. Hey. I'm sorry. Just I'll let go already. She gave one last tweak. One last, excessively painful tweak. As she let go, Ichigo quickly grabbed the reddened and throbbing ear and flooded it with soothing demonic energy. Utilizing his high-speed regeneration, relief surged forward and dulled the ache. I would also thank you if you ceased attempting to seduce my girls. Ichigo gawked up at her. Seduce what gave you that kind of crazy idea? Grafia lifted a disbelieving brow, and Ichigo couldn't do anything but gape further. An innocent maid offered kindness, in the form of an apple, by powerful and handsome devil. But not before he encourages her to stand up to a figure of authority. Grafia let out an uncharacteristic snort. Lucifer himself would be pleased with your machinations. Well, if you put it like that. Ichigo's face fell in a grimace. You're reading too much into it. Grafia shook her head as she pressed a hand to her brow. I too was once a young thing surrounded by lords of great power and majestic rule. I would be quite surprised if she went to bed tonight without thoughts of you. Ichigo's cheeks colored significantly and he turned away from Grafia. Neither of them said anything for several moments until Ichigo caught her shift her weight from the corner of his eyes. I am quite upset with you, Ichigo-kun. He swiftly turned around with surprise etched clearly on his face. He couldn't remember doing anything to upset her well, not recently anyways. Regardless, Ichigo strove to give her as few problems as possible, knowing all too well the massive undertaking that Grafia's workload was. You are. He sat straighter on the stool. Yes, I am. Her lips quirked dryly. Your little temper tantrum caused quite the substantial property damage last night. Oh oh, shit. Ichigo ran a tired hand over his face and gave a heavy groan. I don't suppose my next paycheck will cover it, will it? He sighed. Your next ten paychecks won't cover it. She crossed her arms and gave him a severe look. 
half the lower hull in the west wing has been reduced to cinders. The ebony inlays utterly scorched, the crystal glass windows melted, the hand-woven rugs left to ashes, and every piece of artwork wholly ruined. Ichigo dropped his head down onto the countertop with a painful thud and groan. Yes, I would say the same. I would say that you are in quite a bit of trouble. I would say that there will be hefty retribution to pay. Ichigo blinked onto the stone counter before slowly raising his head and giving her a cautious look. But, the Lady Lucifer smiled rather vengefully. But, this gives me a rather plausible excuse to allow considerable remodeling of the castle. You have my gratitude, Ichigo-kun. You're er welcome. Rafia looked quite pleased as she nodded to herself. Yes, I've been meaning to make several changes, however, there have been several difficulties in the past. Difficulties? Rafia slid gracefully down next to him and took a grape from a vine hanging out of the fruit bowl. With all the elegance of her noble lineage, she slowly pushed it past white lips with the tips of her fingers. Shortly after I accepted Serzich's proposal for marriage. And didn't those words fill him with terror. Not from the actual wording, but rather, the context. Because the lack of titles and obvious personal matter meant that the maid had taken the backseat to the woman. That terrifying woman who was incredibly accomplished at getting what she wanted. He began the making of this castle to serve as our home as well as his personal base. During the actual construction, the Lady Gremory suggested several designs and had a weighty hand, as well, in the interior decorating. Raphia sniffed disdainfully. I am fond of change and like to have a variance in my home. However, Serzich's is loath to upset his mother and often concedes to her subtle bemoans of having her effort taken down. In these instances words such as, ungrateful, unappreciative, uncouth, are even thrown about. I see. Oh hells no. Ichigo was not about to involve himself in a supernatural showdown between a mega-powerful devil and her mother-in-law. Raphia's frown quickly turned into a dark glint and she gave a low laugh. Your little display has most wonderfully wrecked all the aesthetics of her ladyship. It's such a shame, really. Ichigo opened his mouth to respond, but no words came from his brain, so he simply shut it back with a plop. Raphia gave him a sympathetic smile and patted him on the cheek. There, there. Young and inexperienced thing that you are, you can hardly be held accountable for your lack of control. At worst we'll have to assign you some extra sessions with Mathers to help with your control. Ah uh, thank you. You're quite welcome, Ichigo-kun. Grafia snapped her fingers and, much to Ichigo's complete horror, a goblet of dark amber liquid conjured next to her on the counter. Now, on to more painfully important matters. She picked up the glass and gave the liquid a swirl before taking a slim taste. You're, in the danger of sounding cliché, love triangle which you have most spectacularly landed yourself in. His horror grew by several magnitudes. My what? He nearly jumped out of his chair in response to her words. Where in the underworld did she come up with such a ridiculous idea? It wasn't as if he were simultaneously involved with two women vying for his oh damn it all to hell. Still, he had no intention of speaking of his personal issues with Grafia. Especially when she was being quite liberal with her alcohol. Ichigo kun, please. Grafia quirked an eyebrow as she gave her glass another swirl. There are three things you do in your free time. Studying, training or returning to Japan. And when you return to Japan do you visit your human friends and family? No. You spend all your time with Yasaka and her daughter. He went to defend himself, but Grafia was on a roll. And every time you come back from your trips to Kyoto, you are always in a rather pleasant mood with a silly little smile. Silly little smile. Ichigo mouthed, feeling a tad bit insulted. By your own admission, you have dined with Yasaka on multiple occasions, spent a great deal of time getting to know her, and, on your most recent excursion, accompanied her and her daughter to a festival of merriment. Ichigo swallowed a thickness in his throat as Grafia gained a heavy light of mischief in her silver eyes. For all intents and purposes, you, young man, have been dating Kyoto's resident monarch. Though I have to say, I did not think you to hold such high standards. Royalty well done, Ichigo-kun. He made to protest, however, the more he thought about it, the more he recalled the several instances and interactions with Yasaka and Kunu. He honestly couldn't find it in himself to deny Grafia's assertion. Ichigo Kurosaki, in nearly every practical sense, had been dating Yasaka of Kyoto for the better part of two months and he hadn't even realized it. He reintroduced his forehead to the countertop. Painfully. He felt Grafia's kind-hearted touch as cool fingers began to spread over his scalp. Do you like her? The silver-haired maid's voice ever so gentle, though not without a hint of teasing. Ichigo felt like scoffing in contempt. Did he like her? It was a question he so heavily associated with his public schooling days that it almost offended him. A question filled with juvenile intent as well as the capacity to cause widespread misunderstanding. The word like implied a general form of some frivolous fascination that it was nearly satirical. Thirteen-year-olds liked each other for roughly two weeks before deciding they didn't anymore. 
best friends decided they liked one another before finding a sudden awkwardness and returning to their previous relationship as if nothing had happened. High school students liked each other before some insignificant triviality caused them to fall into a state of indifference at best and petty vindictiveness at worst. Do I like Yusaka? He scoffed to himself. Yusaka was not some pretty little thing to develop a crush on and chase around like a lovesick puppy. What she was was an incredibly powerful woman filled with conviction and capacity. Yusaka had all the elegance and poise befitting her station in life. Yet despite her lofty seat, she held a mundane charm and compassion one would easily expect to find in a single mother raising a child. She had a gaze that was both disarming as well as captivating, all too telling and its quiet understanding that stood proud and unshakable. Like the aspect of Amaterasu that she was, Yusaka shone with a blinding brilliance that filled all those around her with confidence and caused them to burst with sunlight. She was radiant and exquisite in every sense of both words. What she was not was the kind of woman you simply like, in all the petty childish irrelevance that the word dredged forth. Ichigo audibly snorted as he raised his head, supporting it with both hands and allowing a leaden breath of frustration to escape him. Rafia gave a knowing smile and began to rub circles on his back in a consoling manner. I am so screwed aren't I? He liked her quite a lot. Perhaps you ought to tell her how you feel. She suggested lightly. His mouth turned sour. She's a priestess and I doubt Amaterasu would allow Yusaka to go out on any dates, much less with the devil. Hell, the only reason Kunu even exists is because Kyoto's line needs to continue. Did you know that Yusaka doesn't even know who her own father is, much less having met the man? Rafia frowned considerably. I am quite confident that the Lady Amaterasu holds a significant affection for you. I do not believe she would protest to you courting her priestess. Ichigo let out another snort. Amaterasu did openly admit her sentiments in regards to him and Ichigo wouldn't lie by saying that he held similar feelings. Dry as he might, the last vestiges of humanity in him still called out to the supreme ruler of Japan in open admiration. Moreover, Zanjetsu, his bloodthirsty, borderline psychopath of a spirit, was like an over-energetic kitten at the mere mention of the Lady of the Sun. Moon Slayer was the name of his soul. In honor of Amaterasu who had watched him from above the skies since before he was even born. And? Grafia drained her glass as she gave a curt twist of her mouth. I prefer your princess infinitely more over your familiar. At the mention of his enticing dragon, Ichigo felt the beginnings of a headache form at the forefront of his mind. Tiamat was whole separate issue that he needed to handle with the utmost delicacy. Oh, who was he kidding? Anything involving that virtual monstrous embodiment of sex and desire would require the subtlety of a rampaging minotaur in a china shop. She had made her intentions quite clear. The Dragon King was dead set on making Ichigo her new lover and she would not allow anyone to get in her way. He turned a questioning glance at her. You don't like my dragon. Rafira filled her glass with a flick of her wrist and proceeded to take a heavier sip. Tiamat is an immensely powerful being and, along with that power, she has gained knowledge over the eons that many would kill their own mother for. It was one thing for her to nest within the underworld, unperturbed and left to her devices. It is a completely different thing for her to openly align herself with a devil. And one of the most powerful devils in the underworld at that. Ichigo mirrored her expression. Simply by binding herself to you, a pawn of a Satan, the balance between the three factions has shifted immensely. There will be severe ramifications for this. The barb of concern inserted itself within Ichigo, and his face instantly fell neutral. Will she be targeted because of me? Raphia shook her head. Not directly, no. She is far too powerful for any one of the three factions to openly challenge. However, it is all too likely that there will be elusive and indirect routes taken against her. Regardless of her unconventionalities, Ichigo had grown fond of his familiar over the last few days. That someone would bring harm to her because of him most definitely did not sit well with him in the least. Ichigo's concentration slipped from Grafia as he receded into his own mind. He touched a part of him that was ever connected to her consciousness and felt out the bond. Despite finding her to be still asleep, the mind of Tiamat was more active than what he could have possibly imagined. It seemed so alien and strange to him, his familiar's persona. He was assaulted with the mental image of a nexus of energies. Dark blue gas with rampart electricity, each flash of thunder a distinct emotion, impression and thought. The ancient dragon stirred from the realms of dream and he felt the sensation of teasing static across his skin as her mental touch reached out and melded with his. Frowning lips twitched as his spirit could almost make out the musical sound that was her laugh. He sent a wave of serenity through their bond and softly pulled away back to reality. A soft smile playing over him, Ichigo focused on the questioning look Grafia gave him, even as Tiamat's presence echoed through his mind. What? He asked. You are beginning to care for her as well. Grafia stated simply. He blinked. She is my familiar. My point exactly. Grafia dipped her head. Familiar bonds grow in intimacy with a greater degree of sentience on the familiar's part. 
In fact, if we were to examine yours in particular, it goes without saying that a being of Tiamat's extraordinary age possesses an intricacy to her mind well beyond your own. It is quite the unheard of phenomena. After all, why would someone submit themselves to a lesser mind? If Ichigo didn't know any better, he would have sworn that Grafi had just called him stupid. You're saying that I'm going to fall in love with Tiamat? He asked with a slightly incredulous look. Not necessarily, but think on it yourself. She said as she crossed her legs and wrung her hands together in her lap. Already you can feel a consistent presence on her part, you can gain a passive understanding of her current mood, no. That is affirmative nod, she continued. The bond will only grow stronger over time. Imagine, a few years from now, what it will be like for the two of you to constantly touch minds. To know the other spirits so confidentially at all times. His lips parted in a no. She raised a brow. Now imagine what it will be like for the two of you a century from now. Ichigo gulped. There is a reason, Ichigo-kun, that the familiar bond is never done with highly intelligent beings and reserved for simple-minded beasts and other creatures. You'd be wise not to always trust a worm. She knew. The whole entire time she fucking knew. Oh, he was so getting her back for this. So here is your impasse, Ichigo-kun. Grafia tapped the counter with one finger and her goblet was instantly refilled. On one hand you have a woman you are falling in love with if you haven't an entirety already, and, on the other, you have a woman who you will come to love, in one form or another, through simple continued association. Ichigo grimaced as Grafia gained a wicked gleam and hid her smile behind her glass. Quite the story this has become. Never before has the knight had to choose between the dragon and the princess. Whatever will you do, Ichigo-kun. He narrowed his eyes and snatched the goblet right out of Grafia's hands. The maid gave a startled shriek as the dark amber spilled over onto her uniform and then settled to give him a powerful glower. Ichigo shrugged his shoulders in response and downed the entire glass. Massaging his very red ear, Ichigo walked over to his occupied bed with a dark mutter. Lucifer be damned alcohol. As the tip of his ear still ached, Ichigo noted with no little amusement that his familiar had wrapped herself up in white furs in a rather impressive attempt of resembling a furry caterpillar. The Dragon King was all too fond of her luxury and creature comforts. Carefully, he eased himself up on the edge of the bed, sitting just next to her. He raised one hand and pushed away the wild fray of white waves to reveal her delicate features. What am I going to do with you? He whispered absently as brown eyes began to waver in thought. Amber skin lifted away to reveal her hazy oceanic waves. The amat shifted onto her back as she let out a strong hum of content. Eventually, the ancient dragon's gaze settled on him and she held him in her sight for several moments before nuzzling the side of her face into his open hand. Her long arms rose from under the covers and snaked around his neck. Giving in to her tug, he scooted closer to her, and Tiamat pulled herself up, the white furs falling away to reveal firm and full breasts. Though he ignored her nudity as she closed her eyes and she put her lips to his. It was a simple meeting, no passion or deep roiling emotion in the action. Yet, he couldn't help but feel some form of sobriety melt away from the bedroom. Her lips moved against his in a smile, and he deftly wrapped his arms around her to keep her from falling back onto the pillows, all the while making sure to keep his mean neutral. He knew all too well that, given any scenario, she could easily turn it on him and walk away with another cause for a headache on his part. He resisted the frown tugging at the corners of his mouth when he noticed the slight flit of fatigue in her ever-shifting eyes. Did you sleep well? Her lips curved ever so slowly, and she pressed herself back onto him, letting her lips settle on the hollow just below his jaw. He felt the thrum of her voice against his bone. Beautifully all nightmare long. Bilt flashed momentarily before steel honed in his eyes and his arms caged tighter around her. Lightly, he skimmed his chin just over the crown of her head and allowed a single hand to sift through her wild mane. She gave her laugh. That dark and utterly mind-numbing one that had nearly broken him the first time he had heard it. You are being surprisingly affectionate, little one. He stiffened as she accentuated her point by sending a jolt of static over his slow-beating pulse with her lips. As his gaze settled over onto the headboard of the bed, he gave wry drawl. Who was it that said she'd use my guilt against me? The Amat's hands wandered from the nape of his neck down to the line of his collar. Slowly pushing herself back, she gazed on him with every iota of the regal majesty she had effortlessly employed since ages long lost to history's pages. Before or after you so mercilessly exacted your retribution. He gave a noncommittal shrug. Semantics. Now do me a favor and get out of bed. You and I have both things to do. Oh? Tiamat raised a fine white brow. I was not aware there were things required of me. There are. He said dryly. You need to pick out a wardrobe. I'm not going to allow you wander around naked any longer. Tiamat fixed him with a dark stare. The one that wrecked his lower half entirely. I have never met someone so instant on my form being clothed. In every case through my existence, all those who found themselves in my presence demanded the opposite. She gently kissed his cheek. 
though I must question your reason for my being attired, I do believe this resolve of yours is rather endearing. Ichigo sighed at how easily she shifted back into the seductress as well as the impressive amounts of humility found lacking. Although, he'd have to admit to himself that having any conversation without Tiamat throwing herself at him was quite nearly impossible. Ichigo paused for a moment. While it was not the main reason, it was the one that would please Tiamat the most. And the happier she was, the more agreeable to complying with him she would be. 1. It's considered inappropriate and embarrassing in today's world to walk around nude. 2. The idea of someone else looking at you in that way pisses me off. She looked taken aback at his blatant admission before her face fell into small amusement. You have no need to lie to me, my master. If you truly feel so strongly about apparel, then I shall guard myself. She tapped at his chest for a few moments before he broke the silence between the two of them. I wasn't lying. She looked up from her fingers and blinked. What? He pressed his lips into a fine line and averted his gaze. I wasn't lying. The idea of someone else looking at you, all of you well let's just say that it doesn't make me happy and leave it at that. There was a slight widening to her eyes and Tiamat grew a small smile. One that he had never seen on her before. Devoid of her past tragedy, beyond the deliberate thirst-ridden gaze, she pressed that smile against his lips and slowly pushed him down onto the bed. She murmured across the corners of his mouth. And here I thought my grandeur was entirely lost on you. Your humility, certainly. Ichigo shook his head as she pushed back his hair and combed with her fingers. Do you want to know what I thought when I saw first saw you, flying through that storm and roaring into the sky? At the tilt of her head he gave a fond smile and said, I thought, no matter how I look at this dragon, this thing which would gladly tear me to pieces, she has to be the single most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So trust me, not a thing about you goes unnoticed. She froze and Ichigo blinked in confusion. Her eyes suddenly surged in life and emotion, and Ichigo was left without breath. There was a sudden hunger to her now. A sense of urgency and need. Hiamat's lips moved, touching him in a sluggish fury, and she gently bit down onto his lower lip. It was a slow-burning kiss that grew even more profound as she fisted her hands in wild orange locks and pulled him in deeper. A familiar bond flared and Ichigo felt every ounce of desire well up from his dragon as she gave into bestial desire. Each corner of his mind filled with primal craving and need slammed into him hard. He began to respond to her overwhelming passion and the fingers of one hand firmly pressed themselves across her hips. Touch searing, Ichigo brought the other hand to the back of her neck as he felt her tongue slip past his lips and trace over his teeth in a line. They broke apart, each looking at one another in the sudden torrent of lust. It was a fleeting moment as they both slammed back together quick enough. With renewed vigor, Tiamat sent her tongue back in his mouth and Ichigo set his hands to wander all across her body. Fondling her curves, caressing her ass and tracing her breasts with his fingers, Ichigo mapped out Tiamat's full glory with his touch, while the Dragon King did her best to dominate his mouth and tongue with hers. Eventually, Ichigo gripped her under the thighs and lifted her higher onto him as he sat up. Without any warning, he leaned forward and took a perked breast into his mouth. Tiamat gave a pleased cry as she tightened her grip in his hair and threw her head back with a growl as Ichigo began to roll her other nipple between his forefinger and thumb. Holding her tight, Ichigo flipped her onto her back and continued his assault on her breasts. Tiamat groaned darkly as Ichigo bit down with his teeth and, hands still firmly entrenched in his hair, she yanked his head up roughly. Breathing heavily, Ichigo locked eyes with the panting dragon before she pulled him into another agonizing kiss. There was a pulse of power as the room slowly mounted with the uncontrolled energies of the two massively powerful beings. The air grew thick and stifling, leaden with all of their pent-up frustrations. Most of Ichigo's possessions were knocked to the floor as Tiamat gave a snarl of greedy pleasure. As his lips moved harshly on hers, they both took a moment to breathe, but Tiamat would not allow him to pull away in entirety. She gave a throaty sound, a rumbling of thunder and a ring of savagery, as she roughly brushed their noses together. His hands continued their assault on her bosom, but Ichigo threw his head back with a gasp as he felt her fingers at the base of his neck and a spark of static rupture through his spine. Tiamat took advantage and reversed their positions, flipping him over and straddling him. With a dim roar erupting from her chest, she brutally ripped his shirt off and swept down to bite him on the shoulder. Ichigo's face contorted as he let out a hiss. Tiamat seemed to have some fascination with wounding his shoulder, as this was the third time in 36 hours that she had drawn blood from the same. Exact. Spot. Eyes flashing crimson and teeth gnashing together, Ichigo gripped her hair and tore her off his shoulder. Blood splattered across his chest as it flew in spittle from Tiamat's maw. Her eyes lit in serpentine, Tiamat dipped her head in a low growl, challenging him, daring him, to deny her want. Ichigo pulled the malice from within as his answer, and the entire floor began to shake as fiendish and draconic energies clashed violently. A single clawed hand fell onto his chest, pinning him down with such force that the bed actually collapsed and fell flat onto the floor. The legs unable to cope with her monster strength. 
it was only with the sound of shattering glass that Ichigo managed to regain any semblance of control of himself. His voice warped with infernal taint. Tiamat, enough. Her teeth fell in a vicious snap, though her growls lowered to dull vibrations, and her features returned to their elegant neutrality. Yet her eyes never lost their primal sheen. Ichigo inhaled sharply and spread himself eagle, even as his familiar panted while she straddled him. Letting out the air heating in his lungs with aggravation, Ichigo shadowed his eyes with a hand. Willing the world away in blackness for the moment as he attempted to restrain the whirling emotions in his mind. He took another deep breath, noting the still and stiff form of Tiamat, and silently rose his other arm towards her. He felt her stiffen even further, but eventually her muscles relaxed against his abdominals, and the sensation of her silken thighs sliding across him sent a current of electricity as she pushed herself on him. Their chests heaved in unison, and Ichigo brought his arm back down, wrapping it around the dragon settled across his torso. His one arm held her tight, whether to restrain her or to simply have her pressed against him, he didn't know. Several minutes passed, where the two clung to one another and labored air into their lungs. After a while, Ichigo took his hand off his eyes and made to sit up, shifting Tiamat in his arms until he was cradling her against him. She cupped her hand around one of his shoulders while placing her head against the other. For the second time today he repeated the same words to himself as he dragged a tired hand through his hair. What am I going to do with you? She laughed against his neckline and whispered with sex. My counsel would be to give another kiss, but there is a great disbelief in that you would heed my words. Damn straight. He muttered, even though he pressed his mouth on the top of her head. A chill passed through him as Tiamat's cool breath breezed over his collar, and he instinctively raised his body temperature. In response to his warmth, she snuggled herself further into his arms. Tiamat. His fucking beautiful, insanely powerful, near-sex crazed, headache-causing and downright arrogant dragon. It wasn't even funny how out of depth he was with this one. Azen, the Espada, all of Soul Society they were a fucking joke when compared to the woman in his arms. He let out a mirthless chuckle. He could only imagine the sheer insanity that would ensue if Tiamat were ever introduced to the Japanese afterlife. The Dragon King took pride to a completely different level. The nobles of Soul Society would have a run for their money if his dragon ever got near them. Well, that, and a possible death sentence. He still didn't know how powerful his familiar was. However, he had an inkling it was more than what most could handle. She was easily a match for any Satan-class enemy, and that was when she was simply playing around. With her unnatural command over weather, he figured that it would be a simple thing for Tiamat to conjure up a storm that could put even the most significant natural disasters in human history to shame. Another laugh escaped him, this time reaching his eyes and filling them with amusement. Ichigo began to wonder what would happen if Tiamat ever came across that prideful bastard Grimjo. The image of Tiamat throwing around that overgrown cat was all too hilarious. As sanity slipped from your grasp, little one. Her voice of smoke and ink-like husk breaking him from the moment of wild imagination. No, not yet. He shook his head, allowing his jaw to rub against her head. I'm just thinking how ridiculous my life is. He felt a hand touch his cheek as she directed his gaze down to her. She looked up at him, eyes dancing in blue mischief. You are still young. There is still a great deal of time for it to get worse yet. He snorted even as pushed her hair out of the way so that he could rub her back. She melted in delight as the pads of his fingers bled warmth up and down her spine. Oh yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to all of it. Her lips pressed tenderly on his sternum, and she murmured against his ever-heated skin. Welcome to the ranks of the undying, my master. Damn it at all. He could feel his arousal come back as Tiamat fell back from blunt assault to passive seduction. The worst part was that he knew that she wasn't even consciously trying. Tiamat simply was that stunningly appealing. A primordial that embodied femininity was downright devastating against the male population of the world. And, by her own admission, she was quite accomplished in attracting her own sex as well. Ichigo leaned his head against hers and let out a tiny sigh. I have to get up. She let out a soft groan and quietly snaked an arm around his back, pulling him closer and burying her head deeper into his shoulder. Stay here with me your heat is the most comforting one I've felt in centuries. He barely suppressed an irritated twitch and blew a strand of hair out of his eyes. Tiamat. I have things to do. We have things to do. Before she could respond, there was a hard knock on the door that caused both of them to look up from their shared position. Ichigo frowned as he pulled the covers up around them and called out. Enter. The door swung open, and a smartly dressed butler stepped in. His gaze narrowed and he pulled the heavy blankets over Tiamat in entirety. Focused entirely on one of the castle's staff, he completely missed the satisfied smirk playing on the lips of his dragon. My apologies for the interruption, my lord, however, the prince requests your presence in his office. Ichigo nodded. I'll be there in a minute. The butler bowed at the waist and left, shutting the door behind him. Ichigo shook his head, wondering what Serzich's wanted with him as he let his arms fall away from Tiamat and went to slide off the bed. 
unfortunately, for him, in that moment, Tiamat gripped him around the waist with her freakish strength. Utterly locking him in place. You can't be serious. He rolled his eyes. She merely smiled darkly up at him. Quite. I should never have come back to the room. He muttered as he closed his eyes and gave a tired sigh. What's it going to take for you to let me out of bed? My bed? He mentally added. She put her chin on his abdominal walls, and Ichigo hated how he instinctively flexed at her touch as her eyes smoldered up at him. She gave an enticing smirk, and he was immediately put on guard. No. He was adamant in that he would not fall into her pace again. As you will. She shrugged as her arms tightened considerably. Ichigo's eyes narrowed, though not before a black light glinted hard in them. If there was good thing that had come from their intense session not ten minutes ago, it was the discovery of this. Ichigo raised a hand with all the doom he could muster and placed it on the side of her neck. Her eyes widened in panic and she jerked from his touch. Wah? No. Stop. Little one. Both hands at work, Ichigo began his attack without any sense of mercy. She cried out and not once did he stop. Every scream she made only made him smile even further. She shrieked and begged for him to cease, but he only shook his head and his smile curved all the more dangerous. This would be his revenge. On her. Is familiar. Yes, she was completely helpless beneath him, squirming and writhing, her pride left forgotten and shattered into a thousand pieces. Every time his fingers flitted across her skin, her back harsed and she convulsed in his heartless torture. You should have listened to me, Tiamat. Ichigo stated with cold satisfaction. Little O1 tears gathered in her eyes as she barely managed to labor out of breath and turned around, desperate to crawl away from his vicious onslaught. Ichigo, however, was having none of it and quickly climbed up onto her back. He placed his anguished touch on her again, eliciting more of those shrieks, which brought savage delight to his ears. He wouldn't stop. Not until she broke. This ancient creature who had ruled empires and caused the fall of many kingdoms. The mother of dragons who commanded armies of the most dangerous creatures to ever arise. The chaos karma that had brought untold destruction upon all the enemies that dared to court a wrath. The undying storm, which had drowned entire populations and dragged civilizations to the crushing waves and under the sea. This unreasonably beautiful creature, which had chosen to become enamored with him and became the single greatest source of turmoil in his life. And above all, the woman whom he had no choice but to admit was worming her way into his heart. Ichigo smiled diabolically. Dragon King Tiamat was utterly at his non-existent mercy now. And all because she was ticklish. Tiamat continued to howl with laughter and only stopped as Ichigo realized that he shouldn't be putting his boss off any longer. Good-natured or not, there was still a level of professionalism to be expected between the two devils. His dragon buried her face into the bed to stifle a bout of very uncharacteristic giggles. Ichigo himself gave a chuckle as he laid down on top of her and, in a movement that surprised both of them, lightly kissed her cheek. A slight warmth filled his face and he quickly scampered off the bed. Behave yourself while I am gone. When I come back, I'll take you to the city like I said I would and we can do your shopping there. Serzichas leaned back in his throne-like chair with amusement, playing plainly across his aristocratic features. He had that teasing quality to his eyes that always put Ichigo on edge. Really Ichigo-kun. Lucifer's lips kept twitching. Extensive property damage is what landed you in my hands in the first place. One would think that you'd have learned your lesson by now. Ichigo scratched his cheek and smiled ruefully. Right. Sorry about that. Things got carried away, I guess. Serzichas gave a small laugh. I would assume as much. Tiamat is quite the handful from what I've been sensing. Although, such a magnificent woman, you will have half the underworld's male population on your heels now. Vying for the attention of that illustrious being. A minor frown creased his brow. I can take care of myself and my familiar. No doubt. Serzichas dipped his head. However, you must know that your familiar's name carries much weight in the supernatural. You've had eyes on you before, now, I fear, they've only multiplied. Nisan told me as much. Ichigo sighed as he put hand to his hip and shifted his weight. Yes. Serzichas leaned forward, placing his chin on folded hand supported by his desk. An old one with such significant power cannot be ever put far out of mind. Always have the various mythologies kept a wary eye on the greatest of the dragon kings. Nisan said that people might attempt to target her now. Both of you, I would say. The devil said as his mouth set in a line. Alone, both Tiamat and Ichigo Kurosaki are incredible threats to anyone. Together. They would be a force few could hope to match. Though I doubt there will be open attacks on your person. Serzichas snapped his fingers, and a comfortable and plush-looking chair appeared in a puff of black smoke. He gestured towards the chair and Ichigo seated himself with a grateful nod. The amat becoming my familiar is going to have political fallout, won't it? Serzichas tilted his head and Ichigo saw a thoughtful reflection pass through his eyes. Not necessarily, no. 
well it's true that by having aligned herself with you, who are a direct subordinate to me, she has unofficially given us her support, it is hardly seen as an open declaration of allegiance. The Undying Storm is rather infamous for having taken on numerous figures of power as past lovers. One such lover having sent correspondence late last night, Ichigo's eyes sharpened. Had one of her old lovers heard of her re-emergence into the world and decided to rekindle their relationship. Whatever it was, the last thing he needed was for someone to trail after his familiar while she followed him around. That would get annoying quite fast. And, Ichigo was man enough to admit it to himself, the idea of a former flame approaching his familiar caused a spark of jealousy to smolder. Yes, Serzicha said as his eyes danced with amusement. The devil undoubtedly recognized some of the darker emotions rolling in his head currently. Azazel sent a letter to me. Ichigo's eyebrows climbed. Azazel. Yes, the letter's here somewhere. Serzich's waved towards the copious piles of papers littering his desk. He told me to offer you congratulations as well as his condolences. Condolences. A ring of amusement sounding over his expression. Serzich's shrugged. He made some vague reference to some past grievances between himself and her ladyship. Ichigo allowed a chuckle to rumble in his chest as he threw an arm behind the back of the chair. With a growing ease, he touched his familiar bond and allowed Tiamat's mind to meld with his. He played back the moment of Azazel's letter and felt her laughter as it rang crystal in his head. Ah, yes. Darling Azazel. He does have things to answer for, now that I think on it. He didn't hurt you, did he? Not in the least. The touch of appreciation trickled through her side of the bond. Merely a matter to be settled between myself and the twelve-winged tinker. With that, Ichigo felt her recede from the forefronts of his mind, but remained mingled enough to be passively aware of what he was doing. Wondering what she was up to, Ichigo allowed his own mind to traverse the bond and meld with hers. The Amad openly welcomed him and surrounded him with her touch. There was a brief moment of overwhelming sensations before clarity took dominance in his inner self. She allowed him to see out of her eyes, and Ichigo was both pleasantly surprised and impressed that Tiamat had summoned a maid to consult on the newer fashion trends in the human world, as well as the supernatural. As it was, Tiamat was currently spread out on his bed and reading over various magazines on articles of clothing. It was such a normal image that Ichigo couldn't help but feel amused. He pulled away from her mind and returned full consciousness to his own body just in time to hear Serzich's speak. Now, there are a few things I'd like to address with you. Ichigo nodded. Sure. First off. Serzich's picked up a sizable manila folder. Your exam results are in. Serzich's tossed him the folder, and Ichigo immediately tore it open. Spilling the contents onto his lap, Ichigo sifted through the papers until he came upon his test scores. He quietly read them to himself and, with each passing second, his brows climbed higher and higher into his hairline. Serzich's gave a chuckle. Congratulations, Ichigo-kun. You are now officially a mid-class devil. His eyes stayed glued onto the test results. He annihilated the exam. Serzich's continued to laugh quietly. You should share the results with Grafia. She's been quite upset with me because I've kept your test scores to myself and told her to wait until the official release date. Oh uh, yeah, thanks. Now, generally speaking, there's a standing ceremony that involves the 72 families putting on a lot of pompous airs, however, I've told them to exclude you, knowing how abhorrent you are of these things. Of course, I had to cite various responsibilities under your belt you had to take care of. The Chigo looked up from the paper in hands. Oh thanks for that. I don't think I'd enjoy that at all. Serzich's smiled. Quite. Now, without further ado, in the name of the Serzich's Lucifer, and by the authority invested in me, I hang on. Ichigo gave his boss a questioning look as Serzich's frowned and tapped his temple in thought. Sorry, I always screw up that bit. Serzich's waved his hand dismissively before clearing his throat. In the name of the Serzich's Lucifer and by the authority usurped by me, I hereby dub the Baron Ichigo Kurosaki and elevate you to being amongst the ranks of the Lords of the Underworld there's more to this, but quite frankly I don't have time nor give enough of a shit to get through it all. Baron. The minor title of nobility. Serzich's waved off. You won't actually be expected to do anything with it. Though it does come with a few perks. Let's see there's the title obviously, a nice strip of land for you to do with as you please and tax free for the first 50 years, so that's nice those fancy little business cards and oh yes. You can even acquire your own serfs if you want to. Mind you, if you do actually get them, any potential rebellions are on your hands. Serfs. Ichigo's face fell flat. Oh, yes. Serzich's nodded sagely. Might I recommend orcs? Not too intelligent, diligent workers and, so long as you keep them fed, hardly ever complain. The conversation was getting weirder and weirder by the second. Too bad Ichigo couldn't help himself. There are orcs in the underworld. Well where else would they be? New Zealand. Serzich's gave him a funny look. Yes, the underworld supports a very large population of them. 
they used to be much more populous of course, but after a disastrous war with the Reavers, their numbers were significantly culled. It's only in the last 30 years their numbers have begun to recover. What are Reavers? Ichigo had yet to come across that name in his readings. Powerful bipedal creatures possessed of a limited intelligence. They were fashioned by the first sin of wrath as such, they're rather limited to eating, smashing and shitting. Unfortunately, without a Lord Wrath to control them, they've been running wild for centuries. Ichigo gave him a hesitant look. That sounds nice. Trust me, they're not. Serzichas gave a definite shake of the head. Now we've seemed to have drifted from the topic where was I? Ah, yes. As a lord of the underworld, you are now officially a noble, so congratulations on being part of the establishment. But, your station is quite recent and so is the time frame you've spent as a devil. As such, there's a slight issue that has sprung up. Issue? Ichigo was already feeling the oncoming headache. Unfortunately, yes. I assume you recall how I've complained beforehand about clashing with the elders of our race on various policies. You mean those complaints you throw out on an hourly basis? Ichigo crossed his arms and with a thoughtful expression. Nope. Doesn't ring a bell. Serzichas gave a chuckle. Alright, I walked into that one. But yes, essentially, they seem to rearing their heads again. Along with the traditionalist party within the 72 pillars. Let me guess, reincarnated trash rising up too fast. That on. So what are we going to do about? Serzichas began to sift through various piles of paperwork before pulling out several sheets of paper clipped together. He handed them to Ichigo. Flipping the pages with his fingers, Ichigo briefly appraised the filled out form for what he recognized as a rating game. The names Lucifer and Barbados consistently appeared on the form. I thought it was forbidden for the four to participate in rating games. Whatever joviality was in Serzich's expression fell outright. It is. You're the one that will be competing. Ichigo paused for a moment before placing the papers back onto his desk and sitting all the way back in the chair, Ichigo crossed his legs. You expect me to fight a pillar lord and his entire peerage by myself. Ichigo wasn't stupid and he knew that Serzichas was actually what many would consider to be outright brilliant. Serzichas was obviously planning something here. I am giving you permission to release your complete array of abilities. Ichigo gave Serzichas a scrutinizing look. You want me to release my full power? Well I'm not telling you to do anything. Just that if you need to release your power you have my permission. I'm sorry I think I misheard you. Ichigo tilted his head with incredulity. You want me, me, to go nuclear in the middle of the city. Serzichas gave a dismissive wave. Don't worry about it. Ajuka came up with a way to keep barriers erect even under severe distress. How do you think Satan-class devils train their full powers without having cartographers to rearrange our maps every few years? Ichigo gave him a pointed look. If this Barbados guy dies, it's going to be clearly on your head. Serzichas scoffed. If Barbados dies, then I'll give you a raise for ridding me of him. Oh, he's one of those types of politicians. The ones with more ambition than sense. Ichigo smiled faintly as Serzichas rubbed his temples. It has been one of my biggest regrets allowing him to ascend to his seat on the pillars. There are few things in this world I hate more than idiots. Is that everything then? Nothing else. Not quite. Ichigo gave a questioning look as Serzichas hesitated for a moment. Ichigo kun. He started off tentatively. I am Lucifer. Ichigo snorted. So I've heard. And despite what some may say, I've done a rather fair job at living up to the title. And with that, Ichigo realized where Serzichas was going with this new line of discussion. There are times where I am forced to make a decision for the betterment of our society. Decisions that might not make everyone happy. In fact, they usually don't. Serzichas. Ichigo allowed a hint of power to creep into his voice, and the devil responded by gaining a sharper gleam in his eye. We've already been through this. We have. Serzichas sighed. I'm just giving you a heads up, right? Ichigo gave a single nod and pushed himself up off the chair. I trust you, so do what you have to and I'll do the same. Serzichas paused for a moment before he gave a small, reflective smile. You are an infuriatingly good man, Ichigo. Ichigo shoved his hands into his pockets and gave a noncommittal shrug. Just remember, I'll still kick your ass regardless. As Ichigo turned around and made for the door, Serzichas whisper carried over to his ears. Why that little brat? Not being able to resist, Ichigo left a parting shot. By the way. He turned around with a smirk. Nissan plans on doing a massive interior redecoration of the castle good luck with settling that between your wife and mom. Serzichas made a choking noise as what little color he possessed left him completely. Ichigo closed the door with a smile, barely noting the sound of a heavy thud hitting the floor. Ichigo found himself back in Kyoto as, apparently, Tiamat was not quite ready to out shopping. The dragon within her had finally given way to the woman, and she was entirely engrossed with catching up with all the considerable fashion across the world. Ichigo had caught Tiamat gazing at everything from Japanese kimonos to Indian saris and to his complete dismay, bathing suits. 
he had a feeling, come next trip into New Lilith, his bank account would have several hefty charges to it. Not like he couldn't afford it though. Granted, he wasn't exactly rich, but Ichigo was paid far more than the average civilian worker. And considering his basic needs were all provided by Serzich's in the underworld and his tuition was mainly covered by government grants and scholarships, Ichigo had very little to spend on. In fact, the only thing Ichigo actually spent any serious money on seemed to be his consistently diminishing clothing. He made a mental note to ask Grafia if she knew of nigh indestructible apparel out in the supernatural world. Or, at the very least, something a bit more durable. So, without anything else to do in the underworld and Tiamat being quite the, crude as it sounded, stereotypical girl, he honestly had nothing further on his schedule, save for going back to Japan and giving a rather earnest and severe apology to Yasaka and Kunu for the abysmal behavior of his familiar. Strangely enough, it was Tiamat herself who sent him along his way. Quoting he needed something to do other than wasting time around the manor. She also went as far as to say that even if he received an ounce of affection from the woodland creature, she'd answer back with her own brand in tenfold intensity and passion. Ichigo shivered as he remembered the glint in the dragon's eye as she made the dark promise. Honestly, she was acting as if they were married instead of whatever they were. And with that, another tremor passed through his shoulders. The thought of being married, let alone to Tiamat of all people, left a dry taste in his mouth. If he ever happened to pass by the Middle East in the future, Ichigo asserted that he would pay his respects to Abzu. Poor bastard was probably led around on a leash by his draconic widow. Ah, Kurosaki Dono. A voice called out to him as he approached the palace entrance. A single servant quickly descended down the stairs. Haim Sama gave orders to show you in if you visited in the future. Ichigo nodded a silent greeting to servant. Is Yusaka busy or can I see her? If the servant showed any displeasure at how overtly familiar he was being with Kyoto's monarch then she didn't show it. She bowed to him and said, Haim Sama has given orders that you be taken to her directly upon your arrival. Allow me to escort you. Yeah, sorry for the trouble. There is no need, I am happy to be of assistance. As the girl turned around, Ichigo cast a glance up at the blinding sun, harsher and hotter than what he was used to feeling. A momentary frown crossed his lips as Zanjetsu simmered from within his soul. Something was upsetting Amaterasu, and Ichigo found his own mood souring in return. Gurusaki don't know. Whatever it was, Ichigo put it behind him and pressed on to talk to the woman who, according to Grafia, he'd been dating this whole time. Yeah, I'm right behind you. Isaka stared softly into the unflinching gaze of brown lightly sprayed over by strands of long orange. She pushed her own gilded locks away from him and willed all the majesty in her eyes forward. Soft lips, pink and full, parted and easily, the word spilled out. By the divine authority of Amaterasu Sama, we've been wed. There was no reaction, and Yusaka herself said nothing. Only after a near complete minute she sighed and gripped the side of her head. No, no. I sound like a complete bitch. Isaka waved her hand, and the image of her husband in the mirror reverted back to her own reflection. Back to the drawing board, I guess. She absently muttered to herself. She crumpled up the piece of paper in her hands and tossed away from her vanity. Allowing it to join several other similar sheets that had been discarded as well. Various little speeches littered across her bedroom floor, each a small prose on what she would tell Ichigo when she finally revealed her big secret. She had been at it all morning. Writing out various scenes of what would, ultimately, be her confession. While she was not unused to giving out weighted news and decrees, it had never been one of such a personal matter. A small part of her wondered if she could simply mail him a letter or send him a voice recording. Actually, why couldn't she? Nothing so crude and dismissive, but, perhaps, she could simply hand him a letter and have him read it while she was with him. It would get the confession out of the way seeing as she somehow couldn't find the resolve to give sound to her words. Once he was done reading the letter and after she was done assuring him it wasn't some jest in poor taste they could discuss in a civilized matter, no. Isaka suddenly sighed. The cowardly way to do anything. He deserves better than that especially since it seems all too akin to a schoolgirl's confession. Still, the idea was a good way for her to process her thoughts if anything. Picking up another piece of blank parchment with ink-stained hands, Yusaka began writing out the letter that would possibly help her find the right way to confess everything to her husband. It took her little over an hour to write out everything. When she was finally finished, Yusaka once more placed the image of Ichigo in her mirror, picked up her letter, and slowly began to read it out loud to herself. Dear Ichigo, you may find this letter coming to you as surprise and its contents to be quite astonishing, though I implore you to read it in its entirety. Not one word written down is a lie. If it were, then I fear that my sanity will most likely be left broken for the grievances I have carried for many weeks now. Truthfully, this all begins nearly five years ago, where a young man born in the human world with extraordinary talents. I've known of this boy, of the adventures he led and of the burdens he has carried. How could I not? My patron, my lady, my mother, how she used to regale me of his life so often. 
I, who have served her faithfully for centuries, was left to being filled with twinges of envy as she spoke of the child who had captured her heart and love with his magnificent will. Her eyes would sparkle with radiant starlight and she filled the world with her majesty as she fell further and further in love. Her child, her son, she used to call that young man who had so splendidly stolen her affections. How could such a human ever take what had been mine for over 400 years, I wondered. How could my endless devotion be overtaken by a mere child? So I said watch to him, even as my lady did the same from skies above. I saw his struggles, his perseverance and all of his toils as he sought to protect all that he held dear. Admirable indeed were the thoughts in my head. So I left him be, knowing that he was a worthy soul, shining with a clarity so rarely, yet only, found in humanity. Our tale then skips ahead to four years and some months into the future. Where the strong-willed and resolute guardian sat now on a throne of shadow and fire. Where he was once a defender and sword against evil, he now stood resolute amongst the lords of discord in the deepest bowels of the underworld. I admit to myself, and to you, I felt betrayed. I did not understand why one who brought hope and light into the world would become such a thing of vile energies, pressing and twisting against the natural realms. My lady was filled with terrible and crushing grief. Not since the days where she warred openly with her brothers did her tears flow so deeply. Her misery was mine and I came to resent him. And yet, despite the supposed betrayal, the hero turned devil was still dearer to her than even I was. So I confronted her. Demanded why she continued to cherish what was obviously tainted and fallen. Her answer still chimes in my soul to this day. But there treads the mother that loves her child, not. And then he came to me. That child drowned in darkness so deep it threatened to consume the world itself. His every step caused doom to echo, and his every breath caused souls to scream. He entered my palace, my siege of power, and did he ring of arrogance and cruelty. Did he carry with him the stench of depravity and sin? I think not. He came in, carrying in his arms, my daughter of all things. Indeed, in that moment my darling Kunu stepped out of his arms and came prattling across the floor to me, my heart must have split in four separate shards, one for each corner of the world to whisk away. I did not find it there. Not a single hint of the monstrosity I had expected to find. In all senses, and I do hope you forgive the description, he looked nothing more than the part of a poor teenager. As if, all the splendor of my halls and my own grandeur, I will thank you not to call me a spoiled princess. Were but paltry decorations found at the yard of a human birthday party. Shortly afterwards, I left my body and allowed my lady to speak with that young devil, as she had so desperately wished to do all his life, but was restrained from doing just that by ancient laws binding those claiming divinity. They spoke with one another. The son lost in darkness and the mother left to watch in light. Of what I know not and need know not. And here, does the tale of Yusaka so utterly entwine with that of the young devil. For you see, my lady is quite possessive of what she deems as hers. A little too possessive I would admit. Upon the morning afterward, did I, much to horror and awe, find myself in bed with the young devil. And naked on top of it all. Though nothing occurred between the pawn of Lucifer and Yusaka of, there was a sudden rush behind her, and Yusaka turned around quite suddenly, hiding the letter from view. Akasama. Yusaka blinked as she was assaulted in the form of her diminutive daughter. Who knew? She puffed out as her diaphragm struggled in pain. What have I told you about barging into my room? Who knew offered a shy smile as her ears twitched the top of her head. Sorry, I forgot. But that's not important. Isaka blinked. To the contrary, she thought it was quite important that her daughter learn not to barge into people's rooms. What if she were doing something private a time like changing or? Her eyes settled on her bed and, unwittingly, her mind drifted towards the distinct memory of Ichigo's naked form. A very prominent shade of crimson dusted her cheeks and Yusaka felt quite hot all of a sudden. Akasama. Are you okay? You look red. Kunu leaned in and placed a tiny hand on her forehead. I am fine dear. Yusaka offered a kindly smile while taking her daughter's hand away. If you say so. Kunu's eyes then drifted downwards to the letter clutched in her hands. Uh oh. Kunu's innate curiosity, once piqued was fairly troublesome to obstruct. What's that? her eyes taking on a strange gleam, the gold in them a rather disturbing glint and shade. Yusaka would almost say they were wolfish. Nothing. Yusaka said briskly. Just a simple document that required my attention. Then I see. She put the letter behind her on the dresser. No Kunu, it's very important and I can't have you damaging it. Awa. Oh. Her shoulders swayed in a pout and Yusaka resisted rolling her eyes. Now. She gathered the young Kikvi in her arms and held her. What's the supposedly important thing that you have going on? After briefly snuggling into her stomach, Kunu looked up with an angry mope. What happened at the festival? I was having so much fun then all of a sudden I'm in my bed and Ani Sen is gone. Sweetheart. She ruffled Kunu's ears. Don't you remember? You fell asleep after the fireworks and your Ani Sen carried you all the way back home. Just like a princess. 
who knew's face flushed bright, and Yusaka couldn't resist poking her chubby cheeks. He carried me back. The younger of the two Kikbi mumbled. That's right. You look so adorable being carried like that we didn't want to wake you. Yusaka accentuated her point with a kiss to the forehead. So after putting you in bed, he went back home. Gunu looked quite pleased with herself before she sent her mother a sharp look. When is he coming back? For a second, Yusaka's expression faltered, and the haunting image of sapphire eyes slid and dark triumph flashed through her mind. He'll be back soon. He has to go to school too. Speaking of which, have you finished your homework? Ah. Kunu's ears stood tall as her expression turned horrified. I completely forgot. Scampering out her lap, her daughter quickly turned around and ran out of bedroom. Isaka gave a slight chuckle before it slowly fell into a sulk. Lying to her daughter was more painful than she would have thought. But still, what else was she to say? That her stepfather had in his possession an ancient being of calamity and power that rivaled even Susanao-sama in the storm. Sorry darling, daddy had to go take care of his girl on the side. The thought filled her mouth with acid. Diamat. The greatest of the dragon kings and, with Albion and Drag defeated and the divine two hidden from all eyes, she was the mightiest of dragons openly wandering the world. She was a creature both reviled and revered, depicted as loving mother and as unquenchable catastrophe. All through history, her name had come up beside some great legend as a lover and mistress. Having taken the most significant entities to walk this world to her bed only to toss them aside at a later date. And, for one reason or another, she had decided to set her eyes on her young husband. Her nails pierced the flesh of her palm, and she bit down on her lower lip. Oh, she could guess the reason for approaching Ichigo easily enough. Her young husband had the singular and unique power to command the flames of the abyss and summon forth the greatest nightmares known to all of creation. Whether they be of this world or not. But she had seen the fascination that Tiamat had stared at him with. The utter delight and covetous stare that had fallen upon Ichigo, even as he returned her gaze with unadulterated fury. This was no simple fling for the old one. Isaka had easily recognized a woman's desire in those sinister eyes. Tiamat wanted her husband. Isaka let out a frustrated growl as she tasted blood in her mouth. Her nostrils flared as, even though she knew she had little chance, she considered tearing those entrancing eyes from their sockets and throwing back into the sea they came from. She shut her eyes tightly, feeling the skin around them strain as she put on more pressure than necessary. Quietly she took a calming breath. Time. Once she told Ichigo the truth, all she needed was time. Unconscious for the marriage or not, Yusaka could not deny that she had begun to feel something for the young devil who spent so much of his free time with Kunu and her. He was a good soul, shadowed that it was. In the coming years, perhaps even months, Yusaka could honestly see the three of them spending their leisure as a family. With a rueful shake of her smooth golden hair, Yusaka turned around, intent on rehearsing the letter she wrote. A letter that was most decidedly missing. Her eyes flew wide as she flung her gaze over the chest, the floor and then through the entire room. Where on earth Kunu? And then, as if all the world was turned against her, the palace wards flared to life, causing the blood in her veins to slush into ice as she sensed demonic power. A demonic power that was too, too familiar. All sense of decorum forgotten, Yusaka ran out of her bedroom as if the devil himself were after her. Because if he wasn't now, then he would be soon enough. Who knew? Get your butt back here, young lady. It was kind of sad, Ichigo rationalized that he had become so instinctively accustomed to having a small blonde missile slam into his abdomen every time he visited. Who knew? He said through a barely concealed wince. What have I said about slamming into people? Ani san. You're back. Yeah, yeah. He patted the girl hanging off of him on the head. Damn, the girl had a grip. Even Tiamat's holds didn't hurt as much. As he tried to pry her off, but Kunu's grip tightened and she looked up at him with censuring eyes of golden mercury. You should have woken me up. He blinked confusedly through the pain. What? Last night. Instead of putting me to bed you should have woken me up. We could have played more games. Oh right. Guilt washing through him as he remembered the reason he came in the first place. Apparently Yasaka had told her daughter something along the lines of her having fallen asleep early last night. They're sorry about that. Not too sure exactly what Yasaka had told Kunu, he decided to keep his answers as generic as possible. Humph. She finally let go and crossed her arms in a huff. We shall forgive you this once because you carried us as befitting our place in life. As he massaged his ribs, Ichigo idly noted that for a nine-year-old, her vocabulary was quite far along. Much better than his when he was her age. Oh. She lost her princess persona and excitedly held out a long piece of parchment. Ani-san, look. This has your name on it. Blinking in surprise, Ichigo accepted the piece of paper with an amused smirk and briefly looked over it. Written in cramped but neat Japanese characters was his name on the very top corner. What's it say? What's it say? Kunu grabbed onto his leg and asked excitedly. Ichigo smiled as she patted her on the head. Give me a sec. 
his eyes began wandering over the letter and, as he read on and on, his brows crept quite high into his hairline. However, as he came to the second half of the letter, his fingers grew tighter on the paper and a stiffness found itself around his eyes. His hand fell loosely away from Kunu's head and hung limply to his side. With every word read, his eyes grew wider and wider and his breathing became shorter. Five minutes. Ten minutes. An hour. He didn't know how long, just that he kept reading the letter over and over again with frantic eyes. Who knew? At that voice his heart froze and his eyes tore themselves away from the earth-shattering letter in his hands. There you are young Ichigo. Isaka looked about as terrified as he felt. When did you are? The golden kick these words died in a hollow stop as her eyes fell onto parchment clenched in his hand. If possible, Yusaka became even paler than her customary pallor. Uncensored dismay fell into her eyes and what could be only described an insurmountable terror. Ichigo swallowed the thickness in his throat as he continued to gaze upon the woman who wrote the narrative in his hand, even as she seemed prepared to collapse on the spot. Ichigo I I. A single drop rolled forth from her tear-blinded eyes and she looked as if she was about to turn around and bolt. However, one question, one single question stopped her from doing anything. Because this question was all that Ichigo had taken away from the lengthy letter. It was the sole confession in a list of several that mattered to him. Three simple words that blasted any sense from his mind and any conviction from his heart. He voiced it, past all the roaring emotions in his soul and devastated looks she cast into his eyes. You love me? Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.